Guys, all right, let's say that over again. That's actually hilarious. That's the first time that's happened in a while. But reiterate, thank you guys all so much for chiming in. Really, really appreciate you guys. Really, really that's hilarious. I'm so, I'm honestly not even mad. That's just funny. But shout out all you guys. Big live stream tonight. It was supposed to happen yesterday, as many of you guys know. How do we schedule? It was supposed to be with Pat Ragazzo, our good friend who was on the channel a week, a week and a half ago. But we'll be doing that sometime next week. So tonight, it'll be myself alongside good friend who's been on the channel before as well. James Shiano, if you guys don't know James, he's the co-host with Giraffe Neck Mark for their Mets podcast called Mets Up Podcast. I'll be having all those links in the description as always. We have a lot to break down though. He'll be coming in 20 to 30 minutes into the live stream, folks. Whether you're watching live or in replay, thank you guys so much for being here. A lot to get into on the Jeff McNeil report, what is going to come of it. We'll all be breaking down with James as well, the potential trades we could see. Is this the right or wrong move for the Mets? Right, sharing our initial reactions outside of the video I already did. We'll also be taking a look at the promotion that transpired yesterday in-house for the Mets front office. They now have a third, yes, now three assistant GMs working with Billy Epler. Excited to get into that one and plenty more. We will, of course, be doing an extended Q&A towards the end of the show. So again, appreciate everyone. First chiming in, guys. Uh, I see Brennan. I see Christopher, Merlin Full, Miguel, um, John, Mets Talk with Luis, Mets Cards, and more. Uh, going, going down those further, Edward, great member on the channel. Um, Alec, how's it going? Kevin, Sledge, Ja, uh, Dave, Rigi. Um, going down further here, folks. Again, if I miss your name initially, I do apologize, but I'll be trying to get as many questions towards the end of the stream as possible, especially uh, Henry, Jackson, John, Baseball Sports Talk, Adam. All you guys, thank you all so much for being here. Cold and Kish, great member on the channel. Tommy, Max, Dave, great friend and member on the channel. Subscriber, I should say. I know that we do have a new membership on here as well. Peter, thank you so much for becoming a new member on Wardy NYM. Really, really appreciate that, my friend. Thank you so much for being part of the community. Ricky, Guardians of Chaos, uh, Texas Terrence. Thomas, $5 donation. Thank you so much for that, Thomas. Really, really appreciate it. Um, all you guys, thank you so much. But again, let's just dive in. My apologies for being muted in the beginning. That normally doesn't happen, but I'm going to make up for it because we have an extended discussion today, as I said already. So first and foremost, folks, before we literally get into anything, I just want to say I really hope everyone had a very happy and blessed holiday. I know I did. That's why we're not wearing the denim jacket today. I felt it was an obligation. It was mandatory that I wear my new black Mets jersey. It is the Jacob deGrom jersey. Absolutely love it. Wish that there was blue pinstriping, you know, the striping, that would, piping that would go down the middle here. But it is what it is. I still love the jersey. I hope you guys got great Mets-based gifts for the holidays, for whatever holiday you celebrate. I hope you guys have a very happy new year because this probably will be the last stream that we have until after uh, we are officially in 2022. So, again, hope everyone had a very happy holiday first and foremost. But I see a lot of you guys chiming in. Thank you all so much for being here, folks. Continue smashing that like and subscribe button if you're just coming in. Help us get 100 likes for the first short-term goal and help us get a 300 likes by the end of the stream. Always appreciate it. But guys, now I need to ask everybody first in the chat, before we literally do anything, what is your initial stance on Jeff McNeil? Are you for or are you against trading him? Before we get into any discussion on what type of trades we could potentially see, the reasoning behind it, before we get into literally anything, just from a broad standpoint, are you for or against trading Jeff McNeil? I really want to know everyone's initial stance as we're getting right upwards of 200 viewers already in the live stream. Again, thank you guys so much for being here. Got to buy his jersey. I mean, I wouldn't mind one either, even though he's unfortunately not with the Mets anymore, but reasons for that, right? But again, yeah, let me know, everyone, let me know your stance because I know we got a pretty big divide and I appreciate that because that tells me that we have a lot of fans sharing different input. I think that's important and context is more important than anything else. So really, really curious what you guys uh, stand on in regards to Jeff McNeil. And when we look at the poll so far in the stream at over 100 votes, we're almost at 130 already. 57% of you guys have said in the chat, or oh, we're already at 150, I think. 57% of you guys think that Jeff McNeil, yes, you would like to see him traded so far in the poll and the live stream. Um, your four train, yeah, a lot of you guys are. Um, some of you guys aren't as well. Mama Worm, how are you? Great support on the channel. All you guys see all the familiar faces per usual. Appreciate everyone first chiming in, folks. Um, and we're already getting close to 100 likes. So thank you guys so much for that. But yeah, I'm going to just wait another minute. I want to see everyone's thoughts here. You guys know the drill by now. If you're watching replay too, you probably know how the live streams operate by now. I really like to see how everyone, what everyone's thoughts are before I share my own and go on my rants and do all that fun stuff. Why exactly that you actually watch the streams, right? But a lot to get into here shortly. Um, there's enough squirrels in New York. That's a good line. Regardless on what stance you are regarding Jeff McNeil, 
that's a funny comment. I will say that much. Love you too, Mama Worm. I appreciate that. And also, shout out. Look at the mug. Beautiful Christmas gift right there. Look, can we just appreciate this Mad Max mug right here? We got the blue and the orange eyes going. Absolutely love to see it. One of the many gifts that I got that were tremendous for Christmas. Shout out to everyone in my family that was so kind and gifted me all these mess related things. I would be quite disappointed if they didn't at this point, right? Um, what player's jersey am I wearing right now? It's a DeGrom black jersey is what it is. Uh, but yeah, a lot of you guys surprisingly are in favor of trading him. I will. I'm a little surprised. You know, when I looked at the comments of my video uh, breaking down the news initially about Jeff McNeil, a lot of you guys were not on board with it. Uh, but at the same time, that's just the, for the people in the comments. That doesn't go for everyone that's viewing, right? Just because you view doesn't mean that you're going to make a remark about it. But I'm a little surprised about the amount of people that are actually for train Jeff McNeil. It seems like a lot of people have been rubbed the wrong way, um, given his down performance in 2021 and, uh, you know, the locker room incidents and all those types of things. So, again, we're going to be getting into it for sure. No Met series? No. Now, that, that's taking things too far. Yeah. A little too far for me. Um, need more starting pitching? Jeff would be a factor in that. Yes, he would be. I tend to agree with you. But, yeah, like I said, we're going to just deep dive, folks. So, before we get into really deep Jeff McNeil talk, especially when I get, when we get our good friend James Shiano in here, I want to talk about for a brief second before I deep dive it further because I want to know James' stances on the front office promotion. So in case you guys aren't aware, and shout out to Sandy, Stephen A., great members on the channel. Shout out to all you guys for chiming and really appreciate you all. We know the Mets yesterday, according to John Heyman, he's the first to break the news, I'm pretty sure, that the Mets have moved up their director of analytics, that being in Ben Zosmer who was hired by Steve Cohen last year as soon as Steve Cohen came in the reins as majority owner. Zosmer came in for director of analytics, spent six years prior to that with the LA Dodgers, and is now the new assistant GM for the New York Mets. And I'm really excited to talk more about him with James because I, I have a feeling that James really likes Ben Zosmer. I do too. And it's really funny because if you guys look up Ben Zosmer on Twitter, you'll realize that there's nothing affiliating him with the Mets, with baseball. He's actually known he, he brings analytics basically saber metrics into how you can properly vote for the oscars so i think that's something he does on the side i know we wrote a book about it he's a harvard grad from 2015 he's an absolute stud and he's a guy where yeah when you look at him you don't necessarily think that he's the most uh strong baseball mind when it comes to actually what it's like being a player or anything like that he's the farthest thing from it he gives you those vibes of say you know a, a deep podesta to Billy uh, Billy Bean, for example, if you're looking at Moneyball, he gives you those vibes a little bit for sure. It's just so analytically ingrained mind. But he has done gr a great job building the Man Mets analytics department, going from just little to nothing to over 30 people in that staff already, knowing that Steve Cohen is giving him all the funding in the world. And he's only 27 years of age, I'm pretty sure. And he spent six years with the Dodgers. So you're talking, was with the Dodgers since he was basically 19... 19 20 years of age um to now being the assistant gm for the mets and he's not the only assistant of course he joins the others the mets now have three assistant gms and it's going to be him ian levin and bren alderson bren of course being sandy's son so they have all those connections but yeah very excited to see what zosmer is going to do definitely checks off the boxes as a quote-unquote nerd if you will but i don't mean that as an offense as i do a compliment because we all know how important analytics and advanced numbers are in the game of baseball today and how to properly balance them with the eye test and all those things are pivotal. We have those minds. Ben Zosmer, who was of consideration from reports that I saw to even be in the running for potentially GM for the Mets had they not landed Billy Epler and stayed in-house. So there's plenty of belief from what I've already seen about Ben Zosmer, who's an absolute genius from all that I've, I I've uh, garnered information regarding him, that he does look like that he could be that next potentially David Stearns for the Mets. He could potentially be that next big mine. You're even looking at, um, of course, um, Heim with the uh, Heim Bloom with the uh, Parmy, with the Red Sox, who the Mets had the option to hire from the Tampa Bay, Ra Tampa Bay Rays a couple years ago as GM, but they, of course, went with Brody Van Wagenen during the Wolpons era, and, you know, enough said. That's all you really need to know on that point. But, yeah, in a nutshell, I like this move for the Mets a lot with Zosmer. I'm excited to break down a little bit more of him. Because it just it's really interesting seeing him, how young he is, and the position that he's already with the Mets. Somebody tells me that he's not going to be out of the organization anytime soon. And somebody tells me that he's going to have quite the impact to help Billy Epler and the Mets with player evaluation 
and so much more going forward. So exciting stuff for sure. But any, guys, everyone in the chat right now, what's your initial stance on Ben Zosmer? If you know anything about him or if this is the first time you've even heard the name, let me know in the live stream right now. Would love to hear it, folks. And again, if you're enjoying the live stream to this point, make sure to smash that like and subscribe on. I was get a 13K subs. We're the biggest Mets platform on YouTube that's not directly affiliated with the Mets or S&Y for a reason. It's all because of you guys. So thank you so much for the support. Help us get to 100 likes. We're trying to get a 300 by the end of the stream. It's going to be a very extended discussion today. A lot to break down with Jeff McNeil and these trade rumors as well. Um, but yeah, I just I really want to know what you got your guys' stances are on Ben Zosmer is because it very well could vary depending on if you have any knowledge on him and his background or not. I uh, did a little bit deep diving earlier today. Uh, it was very interesting to see um, who he is, the position he is, he's in with the Mets. Very, very interesting. I, I don't I don't have any complaints whatsoever. He's the Mets assistant GM. Yes, in case you guys aren't aware, Ben Zosmer is now the Mets assistant GM, was originally director of analytics. Mets hired him a year ago from the Dodgers. And, of course, Steve Cohen wanting to build that analytics department. Zosmer helped build it from little to nothing to over 30-plus, one of the biggest analytics departments in all baseball already. And they're, con and they're continuing to grow. And for a guy who's only 27, Harvard grad 2015, who was with the Dodgers for six seasons, six seasons, keep that in mind. 27 i believe six seasons he's been with them literally since he was a kid so it's kind of crazy seeing how ingrained he has been and arguably the best organization in all baseball right now when you look at history and the Dodgers, and same thing now with the mets and what he's going to provide for them it's going to be very exciting i'm very much looking forward to it at this rate i'm i'm getting close to uh, assistant gm in a couple years i like the way you think todd dave thank you so much for the five dollar donation really really appreciate that hype in the chat for dave guys Always appreciate it. Gift arrived in your P.O. box. Also, Trey McNeil. I'm going to make sure to check the P.O. box, Dave. And I also saw what you sent me with oh, the e-card. I emailed you back, but I just want to thank you again so much. Guys, if you don't know, Dave has been not just a great friend, but a massive supporter on the channel. He's the reason why we got plenty of different mugs and, you know, everything Mets really you could think of. He sent my way out of just beyond kind generosity for being a great supporter of the channel. So, Dave, thank you so much for everything, my friend. I can't wait to check out what you've sent. I'm looking forward to shouting you out again once I see what that is, and I'll probably feature it in a future live stream or video, whatever it's going to be. And thank you again for the donation. Really, really appreciate that as well, folks. But, guys, let's take a look quick at the poll before we go further. We're 10 likes away from 100 already, you beauties. Thank you so much for that as well, folks. Really, really does mean a lot. Shout out to you all. Uh, let's see. Do you want to see Jeff McNeil traded is what I put in the poll. And 53% of you guys now say yes. So it's getting close. It's it's a tight-knit race right now. Not a, lot of, not a lot of you guys want to see Jeff McNeil gone. And I, I, I can respect that. I can absolutely respect that. What up, Rory McNeil and Dom, uh, Dom Smith for Manaya and Chapman in Oakland. Then sign Nelson Cruz. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, again, I will say, hint, hint, there is a video coming out tomorrow that I think is going to satisfy a lot of you guys. I think it's going to ruffle some feathers for a lot of you guys tomorrow. I think it's going to be highly entertaining, yet highly controversial, depending on what your takes are. So I am looking forward to getting into that, but I'm just fair warning you guys now because I know that uh, the discussion is going to be something else. We're going to we're going to get into it tonight, but it won't be the full-on video and extent extended type discussion until you see it in tomorrow's video. So stay tuned for that probably sometime in the evening. But guys, let's talk about Jeff McNeil. This is going to be the talk of the town. This is something that's going to take up a very large portion of the live stream tonight. So as we all saw, I was on my way. I was doing some last minute Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve because I'm a schmuck. I literally don't prepare for anything. That's if you guys can tell already. I'm an absolute. I'm a joke. I don't know what I'm doing. I need to be more prepared in the future. I need to get my adult game going. 21 years of age. I need to do better than this, right? But as I was gallivanting and doing my last minute Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve, I saw on my phone a report from like 40 minutes prior that, according to Pat Ragazzo, that the Mets are going to probably put Jeff McNeil on the train block once the lockout is lifted in hopes of addressing their rotation with another solidified starter. I broke down my initial reaction. We have that video and the uh, links in the description, as always, folks, if you haven't checked it out already. But to expand further, this one caught me a little off guard in the sense of I wasn't expecting that report to happen when it did. But by no means was I surprised to see it transpire. And I don't think anyone that's been following the Mets for a decent amount right now should be all that surprised. If there's one thing that this Mets offseason has told us, as I said in my video and I'll say again, the Mets are changing their culture right now. And they're doing more with their player evaluation under Billy Epler 
than just performance. If we're basing things on performance based alone, then I find it hard to believe that the Marcus Stromans, the Javi Baez's of the world, would not still be on this club. Even Michael Conforto, when you look at his normal track record outside of his down 2021 campaign. So if you're looking on performance, Aaron Loop wouldn't be going anywhere either. But again, there's more to this, right? And at the end of the day, what I want most for this Mets team is to succeed. I want them to win a championship. I want them to do it fast, same way that they want to do it fast in this three to five year window, right? We're already a year in. So we got four more years for what Steve Cohen is hoping for, at least with this win now stage, these type of players. And what you when you look at what the Mets have done this offseason and how they have addressed this roster, they have brought in quality players, very talented players for sure, different, different uh, levels of degree on that front. But they're all great characters. They're all people that have been spoken nothing short of glowingly on their locker room presence, on their on-field presence. And what is something that Marcus Stroman, Javi Baez, Jeff McNeil all have in common from 2021 is that controversy comes with them, which is unfortunate because that's not something that I wish for any player. And it's something that I don't think uh, is nearly as justified depending on what player exactly we're talking about. And I do believe that just because, say, one mishap happened or one slip up here happened or a down performance, that shouldn't label completely a player on what you can expect from them going forward with the Mets, right? But clearly they're in a direction right now that's prioritizing more than what we would normally expect the Mets to prioritize in player evaluation. And if this tells us anything, it's that Jeff McNeil, he's getting a lot of calls, according to Pat Ragazza from his report. I'll talk to him about it further probably in a live stream next week. But a lot of teams have shown interest in Jeff McNeil. I remember even Michael Mayer, who covers the Mets, does a great job through Mets Mirage. Back in November, he reported that we talked about in a previous live stream a while ago that many teams were already showing interest in Jeff McNeil before this report by Pat even came out, that the Mets do intend to put him on the train block. So teams are evaluating and viewing Jeff McNeil based on not what he was in 2021, but rather what he projects to be in 2022 and beyond. You'd have to be a fool in my mind to suggest that Jeff McNeil is not going to go back to being not, maybe not the same hitter, but awfully close to the hitter he's been throughout his career since he arrived in 2018. And when you look at Jeff McNeil and his ability, and again, guys, shout out all you guys in the chat right now. Continue smashing that like and subscribe on if you're enjoying the stream. And there's one thing that I've always appreciated about Jeff McNeil outside of his versatility is the guy just always hits. You, you expect three hits a night from him. He's an on-base monster, always has been. In 2020, in the short season, he had a slow start, but it looked like he was pulling the ball a little bit more, got a little home, home run happy but then got in a groove and was still over a 310 average hitter. 2021, hamstring injuries, the Lindor incident that very much looks like it has more of a significance than maybe what we realized regarding his character and how it's not even boding well with the clubhouse fully yet, according to the report from Regazzo. Again, we're going to see exactly if that holds true or not, but there's a lot of reasons as to the as to why the Mets are considering Jeff McNeil to be part of it. And at this rate, from what we're seeing, I do think that there is a very strong likelihood that he will be traded assuming that the Mets are getting a deal that obviously they want. I don't see the Mets train Jeff McNeil for the sake of training Jeff McNeil, especially when his value is at his lowest. That would be foolish. But if you're basing things on there being a hot group of teams showing interest in McNeil, looking for his services, knowing he's a guy that has multiple years on his contract left at a cheap price. He's not for Asian until 2025. Still in the prime of his career, versatility on it in that infield, can play the corner outfields. Yeah, I do think that that would be really appealing to a lot of clubs, and a lot of clubs tend to agree from these reports that we've seen. So what exactly type of return can the Mets get? We'll be expanding on that plenty in the live stream. That's something that you can expect to see a lot more of in tomorrow's video. Hint, hint, at the time of recording this, if you guys are following along, it, understand. But simply put, before I go any further, I think it's awfully important for us Mets fans to always realize, especially with how this team is operating now, it's drastically different than what it used to be, okay? As much as I have loved and appreciated Jeff McNeil throughout his entire tenure as a Met, 2021, different story. But again, a lot of reasons went into not just his poor performance, but universally why the Mets were like the worst offensive team in baseball, at least runners in the scoring position. And last time I checked, that's kind of the most important thing you need to be good at in order to have success for an offense, right? So everything went wrong for this team. And I do think that Buck Showalter would really help round out Buck Showalter. I mean, pardon me, Jeff McNeil. I think that the Mets vision right now, I think Jeff McNeil gets back to his normal 300 or 280 to 300 average self. No problem in 2021, regardless on if it's with the Mets or not. So I'm not looking at Jeff McNeil and evaluating him as someone as saying, oh my goodness, he had a down year. 
might as well trade him now because he's never going to be what he used to be. I don't view that. And I do view Jeff McNeil as someone where if he is traded, he's going to thrive. He's going to continue to do well. And if I do compare him to the Daniel Murphy situation when the Mets gave up on him too soon. I do compare him to multiple type situations, Justin Turner, right? But at the same time, as long as the Mets make a trade happen that truly benefits both sides, that benefits their vision now in a win-now stage, if they get another frontline starter to be that number three in their rotation, if they also address the infield by getting another big-name bat of significance that will eliminate any really uh, cause for concern with losing McNeil in this infield, then it's okay. As long as you eliminate those holes and only add, you know, only have a positive out of this, then that's all that matters for me. I have nothing personal against Jeff McNeil. I wish him nothing but the best, whether he stays with the Mets or not. But the last thing I think us Mets fans should be looking at regarding all of this is that the Mets are going to be in a position where, okay, they're just training for the sake of training. They're going to trade him away. He's going to do great. And that's going to be LL Mets. No. You guys, in my mind, you're a fool if you think Jeff McNeil is not going to do well next season. That's not the point. As long as the Mets get a good return and those players do well, it balances out. And that's something that has balanced out in the end when you lost down Daniel Murphy in free agency, when you lost down Justin Turner because you gave up on him too soon. The context to everything is so important. I think that's pivotal more than ever here. Uh, but I do want to address a couple of things here in the live stream, folks, before we go further. Everyone's seeing Rip John. Did John Madden pass away? Oh, that's so that's so sad. No. Let me see. Damn. John Madden did pass away today. That sucks. That's terrible. My thoughts and prayers of John Madden's family and loved ones during this, during this terrible time. John Madden, you know, absolutely NFL legend. I remember growing up playing Madden, the golden voice. John Madden had just an infectious personality was so huge for the game of football and you know passing at the age of 85 you know it's still still really really upsetting that that was sudden yeah i don't think anyone expected that right now at least so thoughts and prayers to his family that that's crushing you know as someone that again grew up playing madden my favorite sport growing up was football john madden was someone that i definitely idolized you know i i always wanted to be a broadcaster when i was a kid and john madden was a massive reason as to why so yeah, that one hit. That one definitely hits home a little bit. I know the same can be said for a lot of you guys um, in the chat right now uh, or watching a replay. So again, um, thoughts and prayers, John Madden's family, loved ones. You know, he's 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 in this he's in a happy place now, I'm sure. But still, crushing stuff, crushing, crushing stuff to see happen. Just broke 15 minutes ago from Adam Schefter uh, for the NFL that he has passed away at the age of 85. So rest in peace again to John Madden. Want to get that out there to to you all. Um, again, though, I appreciate everyone that's been chiming in, guys, sharing your thoughts. We're going to address a couple donations in the live stream. Then we're going to bring our good friend James Shiano in here and really break down so much more on Jeff McNeil, trade possibilities, Ben Zosmer. What's there to like about him that maybe Mets fans that are, don't know much about his background uh, can learn from and so much more. So appreciate you guys being here. John with the $5 donation. Thank you so much for that, John. Appreciate it. Hype in the chat for John as always. I'm all for training him for quality pitching. However, however, they'll need to sign a real utility guy. They'll just the, the, if the Mets lose Jeff McGill, they need to make sure that 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 they either have a second or third base option that's going to be very effective in 2020, uh, 2022. You know, because Escobar can play second or third. So whichever position you feel he's not going to play, that's where you need to address. As long as they address it, then that's fine. Then I can live with it. As long as it's not going to be a scenario where it's going to hurt the Mets, you know, in the next couple of years, then that's something I can live with. But at the same time, I'm not willing to just give up Jeff McNeil for nothing. So it has to be something of significance to really try to sway me personally. I think most Mets fans can agree, rightfully so. But John, thank you so much for the donation. Really appreciate that. Pat Mets, $20 donation. Thank you so much for that as well. Hype in the chat for Pat Mets. Mets want to trade McNeil because, one, they want to change the team culture. Two, if the Mets get Bryant and Rodney Mauricio and Mark Vientos in the pipeline and Cano uh, coming up, the works uh, – this works this year. McNeil becomes tradable. I, I don't expect much of anything with Cano. So I'm I'm one of those that, people that's putting him aside. But I agree with you. The Mets do have options, especially if they get Chris Bryant. That changes the game a lot because then you can put um, Eduardo Escobar to second base and then your infield set um, for sure, at least for the next couple years, right? Um, but Pet Mets, thank you so much for the $20 donation. Really, really appreciate that, my friend.
Where did I get that jersey from? I didn't get it. Uh, I got it ordered from me uh, from a family member for uh, Christmas, but I'm going to assume you probably get it on MLB Shop. I'm assuming that, that that's where you can get it. Um, Stoney, yes, I'm okay. Appreciate. I saw you reach out. I know uh, because I delayed the live stream a day. Uh, some of you guys were asking, you know, if, if everything's okay. Everything's fine. Yeah, it was just it was just a schedule mishap. That's all it was. It was it was nothing more than that. So appreciate that, no less. John, with another five dollar donation. Thank you so much for that, John. Really, really appreciate. It. Does train uh, mean? Uh, pardon me. Does Trey McNeil mean Escobar is a utility guy and means Brian is coming? I think Escobar is in the starting lineup for the Mets regardless on if they trade Jeff McNeil or not. That's my take, to be quite honest with you. I think Escobar is someone that... The only exception I could see potentially Escobar coming off the bench a little bit more is if they keep McNeil and then they still go out and get Brian because that's where you have a log jam then with the way you do with Escobar. You can utilize Escobar at DH or you could utilize him as someone, uh, you know, as a utility off the bench. But I think Escobar is going to be everyday player for the Mets next season. Um, I'll be a little surprised if he's not. But again, if the Mets do trade McNeil especially and bring in Brian, Escobar slots in perfectly at second base for the next couple of years. Um, I think that they should get Brian uh, first before thinking about trading McNeil. I mean, they could. That's that's a possibility. Let's keep that in mind. The Mets can't do anything until the lockout's lifted. I do I do feel confident saying that I do think Chris Bryant is going to be one of those people that is um, on their radar heavily. But the counter I will say to that is, depending on who the Mets may trade Jeff McNeil to, should they get a deep discussion done, one of those teams has a third baseman. That makes plenty of sense for the Mets. On the shorter term, at least. And he does come from a team in the Oakland A's. So I'll let you guys put two and two together and figure out. I don't think that one is a rocket science. So if the Mets, the counter, you know, playing devil's advocate is maybe it wouldn't be best fit for them to trade Jeff McNeil or really heavily consider it and um, and then do Brian after. I mean, pardon me, and do Brian first and then McNeil after. You might say, hey, try to do McNeil first, depending on how long that takes, because maybe you already got your third base your third baseman for the next couple of years if you go that route. So there's possibilities. Um, I think the Mets are going to be very smart about this. Uh, first and foremost, they want pitching. Uh, there's no doubt about that, and I don't blame them at all. The Mets need more certainty in this rotation. Even though that I am excited about you know Taiwan Walker, I think that there's still plenty of upside for him. I think if you can get him fine-tuned after his piss-poor second half in 2021, there's things to like as back of the rotation. Carlos Carrasco, Big question mark, but definitely can be effective if he's fully healthy. That's the thing, health, right? And also someone like Tyler McGill. I think he's someone that will have somewhat of an impact for the Mets, but we're going to see exactly how significant he's out of the bullpen. If he's with the Mets, assuming he's not traded, um, if he could potentially be a part uh, as a longer arm of the rotation or even solidify himself in the rotation. So the Mets do have rotation options for sure. Jose Ramirez is, says Ricky Cortez. Jose Ramirez, I'll touch on this briefly. Um, uh, and then we'll bring James in. Jose Ramirez, I would love. We all would love on the New York Mets. But if the Mets feel set in stone on not wanting to part with any significant prospects, are only willing to really part with Jeff McNeil because they want a starting pitcher, I don't see Cleveland as a great fit. I don't think it's impossible. I think it's something that maybe we discuss as a hypothetical in, an, in a future video. But as of now, there are teams that profile better for the Mets trade-wise than Cleveland does, and you'd have to give up an arm and a leg for Jose Ramirez. And that's something where I don't necessarily know if the Mets want to commit uh, uh, long-term to a third baseman, and in doing so, have to give up the farm. I don't think the Mets want to do that. I think the Mets really only want to do, give up the farm only if it's, say, one guy out of those top five prospects that makes sense for them, knowing that and what they're gaining for a return is going to benefit them right away, and that isn't going to hurt their long-term future. It's hard to suggest that you could land a Jose Ramirez without giving up a Brett Beatty. I don't think the Mets are going to give up Brett Beatty. Um, so again, I find that hard to believe. Very, I find it very hard to believe. I would say Jose Ramirez is probably one of the most unrealistic third base options as of now. Not that I wouldn't love J-Ram and Queens. We all would. But we have to be realists here. Um, if I'm looking at the options, I think there's a lot of people that can profile better for what the Mets are trying to build now while also sustaining their future and prospects.
All right, folks. Let's see. $5, $5 donation from Sniper. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, McNeil temper and him fighting with Lindor is a major reason they put him on the block. Mets don't want bad vibes in the locker room this year. While I don't think that's the only reason, I do think that's a factor. If everything that's been reported is holding true at this point, then yes, culture is important. You know, Mets have made it abundantly clear that culture is a heavy factor for them and what they're building this offseason, but the proper culture, not the culture that's just say, hey, you know, we're all friends. We're, we're having a positive vibes right now. It's more than that because they, they need professionalism. They need sh stuff that isn't going to happen. Don't get me wrong. Lindor was at fault too. Let's not act like he's a saint in this situation. But viewing Lindor versus McNeil, their roles on the club right now, I can understand why McNeil, of course, would be the one that could potentially be cut loose in part because of that culture aspect. Um, going to address one more donation here, folks, and then we're going to bring James in. Isn't Donaldson a better deal than Brian? Same player, 2021 stats with less money and more long-term options. Texas, really appreciate the donation and also appreciate the donation again from Sniper. But my one response to this is Josh Donaldson, big bat. He profiles more as a DH than anything else. He's not one that's going to give you that stellar glove. And don't get me wrong, Chris Bryant's not a good glover either. Fully aware. But KB's versatility is what really makes him an X factor over so many other options. Um, especially because KB is someone where the Mets can have as a short-term third base fit. Then what Brett Beatty is ready to come up, whether that's this or next year, assuming it'll probably be at least a year plus from now until he's really ready to go as an everyday starter. Then Chris Bryant can shift to the corner outfields. So the Mets can get very creative with how they utilize him. And that's really why he's such more of a hot commodity over someone like Donaldson, who has a hefty contract for a couple of years still, is not versatile whatsoever. And he, at this point, he really is more of a DH fit than anything else. I think I would feel more comfortable with Chris Bryant at third base than with Donaldson. But if you're looking for strictly offensive production, yeah, Donaldson makes sense. And you don't have to give up the farm to get him at all either because the Twins – Want, want nothing to do with that contract. So I see what you're saying. I think Donaldson is perfect fit as a DH type, not so much as your everyday third baseman at this point in his career. Um, but that's my stance, at least. I don't think Donaldson's a terrible fit, just definitely not my favorite. And I think KB just had that versatility is the big X factor. Oh, Harley. But let's get uh, James in here now, folks. So give me one second. All right, there we go. You What's up, me? boy? Then? You got me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Okay, there we go. Here, just shift a little bit if you can. So that isn't um, in your way. I just want to make sure that people know what the topics are of discussion. But do you hear everything fine? Yeah, everything great, man. Good to see you. Okay, awesome. How are you doing? Oh, I'm still trying to shift. Hold on. <laughs> no, no, you're good. Here we go. What's up, man? Good. Trying to shift. I, I know that that's something that McNeil, you know, might not be. Yeah, so that's a big right problem now. for Jeff McNeil right now. <laughs> but guys. Dude, I got to say, though, I have, haven't been on with you in a while. Your background looks great. You got a lot of fun new stuff, dude. Oh yeah, dude, I have so many. There's so many like above it that amazing. you can't even see in frame. Yeah, you know? dude, I'm fucking impressed. I'm, I'm sorry, Chris. I'm no, freaking okay. impressed. Okay. Super cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, I remember too when I saw Marks like outside of his frame too. I was like, "There's so much more here. Like the jerseys <laughs> up top. I'm like, yeah. they're hidden. You got to show them." But I can understand why you can't fit them. But guys, if you don't know James, James does a great job with Draft Neck Mark. And with the Metsed Up podcast, they come out with pods every single week. So please make sure to check them out. Links in the description if you haven't already, folks. Uh, James has been on the channel before. Um, pleasure. And he's also someone that's been a great contributor to Pitcher List. And I actually started to get I, – I did not follow them at all. I just started a cut like the past month. I started using them because I was doing research for a bullpen targets video. Mm -hmm. And my the, the amount of advanced information was like perfect. So I've been using them a lot lately. So I just wanted, before we get into anything, what has your experience been like contributor uh, for them? What exactly are you doing for them? And yeah, just expand on that if you don't mind. Uh, uh, of course, man. I Picture List is the third website I've written for. I wrote for a small website called Prospects 365, the Metsmerized first. And then <clears throat> I've been following Picture List for years because I'm an avid, avid, avid fantasy baseball player. And I have been since I was like 10 years old, which is kind of a big reason that my love for baseball is so rooted in stats. And I interviewed with Nick. I've been writing for them for a few years. I write a lot of fantasy stuff during the season, specifically about pitching. And this offseason right now, I'm working on a big um, breakdown and preview of the rest of the free agent pitchers that are still available on the market. And that's kind of on ice right now. So that will come out just after the lockout ends. But, yeah, do a lot of pitching work for them, a lot of fantasy baseball work. I do some massive, again, pitching previews. But love writing, love fantasy baseball. And, yeah, pitcher list run by Nick Pollock, great guy, great website. Everyone should check it out. 
Awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's also part of the reason why I wanted you to come in to discuss today regarding pitchers, because that's what the Mets want, right? While mm-hmm. we're discussing Jeff McNeil. But before we even get into that, I really thought it was important that we talk about for at least a little bit on Ben Zosmer, because as you know, if you see the video that originally trended on Twitter, you would never think that this guy is the assistant GM for the Mets. But I think when I look at him, I said, it gives me the D Podesta vibes. You know, I'm, I love guys that look like they have absolutely no place in baseball when they're in front offices because more often than not they're absolute geniuses and it seems like that he's checking off those boxes so what was your initial reaction to seeing him become assistant gm originally director of analytics for the mets and really his build up to this point and what mets fans can maybe expect from him that they don't have a great knowledge on regarding him to this point yeah dude i love ben zausmer i think that he was really instrumental in the mets defensive improvement last year coming over from the dodgers being one of their heads of baseball operations for the last few seasons if you look at shifting stats across baseball the mets made a massive jump last year and the only team who now shifts more than them are the dodgers especially against right-handed uh batters so you can definitely see his influence in that and a big reason that the mets actually gave zausmer this promotion was because of the title of assistant general manager If you all remember from the last few months when the Mets were trying to interview new people for their head of baseball operations and GM, to get an interview with a person who works for another team, you have to be offering them an advanced title. So now that Ben Zausmer has the assistant GM title, he can only be interviewed by other clubs as a general manager or president Mm. of baseball operations. And since he's only still right now about six or seven years out of college, this means that he's basically untouchable for the next few seasons for other teams. And that was a big reason for this um this promotion. But again, a year with the Mets, his hire was great. He's your classic Harvard nerd, applied mathematics and computer science with the Dodgers straight out of college. The kid, the kid's just a wizard. Matt, everything you want from a young hotshot in a front office. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I took from deep diving him. When I saw his Twitter, I'm like, <laughs> he has nothing affiliated with baseball. It's like nothing. his his hobby is d- doing the saber metrics, if you will, for you know Oscar voting. Mm-hmm. That's what I got from it. He even wrote a book on it. So it was very interesting learning a lot about him in a short period of time. And he comes off to me, at least, as someone that very well could be ingrained with the Mets for a long period of time, Definitely. potentially as their longer term GM fit. If, say, Billy Epler is more the win now and they're looking on a guy that maybe will be, you know, continuously adaptive for a longer term, he might be that. Like, we're going to see what the future holds, of course. But, you know, I've already seen multiple reports or at least, you know, rumblings to say that he's had a pivotal part with not just the shifting, but also just this analytics department, you know, being thankful that we have Steve Cohen, who has all the funding in the world to bring an analytics department that had originally interns with the Wolpons, just interns to now 30 plus people is insane. So I'm loving what I'm seeing from him on how he's building that. The shifting is important too. I'm glad you brought that up because it really wasn't on my mind originally on, you know, because there's no doubt that the Mets literally went from having little to no experience shifting versus being one of the most advanced in baseball like that. And I think that's also a great transition too into the Jeff McNeil thing, because let's just talk for a second. I know that you beat a dead horse with this, but the rat and raccoon incident, because my biggest takeaway from it outside of them both being at fault, you know, both of them were at fault here. And I'm not signing with one or the other, but the one thing I will say is that when you're viewing this on why it transpired the way it did, if what the media has reported is true, again, we don't know exactly how accurate and accurate it is. These things always happen, but for McNeil, someone who's good defensively, but not 99th percentile, percentile outs above average good like Lindor Lindor who hates shifting who still makes sure that he does everything possible to be in that shifting spot for the Mets to have success to have McNeil basically say and you know insinuate that like I'm not going to do that you know I'm going to do it my way is pretty telling on okay there's valid reasons as to why the Mets may very well want to part with him and it's so much more than just performance based at this point definitely I think that's probably the biggest reason why the Mets do not to do why they are looking to trade McNeil. It seemed like he was a little bit cavalier in the way he handled things from the front office this year. Again, you talked about that shifting thing, and that's something that's come out since in the last few months. While Lindor doesn't like shifting, and he's vocal about that, he's still very willing to do everything the front office tells him. And he at least gets in line and he listens to the people he should be listening to, very into the chain of command. McNeil, it's come out that he really hasn't. And something like that, I think, could disrupt Francisco Lindor because if there's if there's a shift on and Lindor is in a certain position and McNeil's not where he's supposed to be, that's going to affect Francisco Lindor, how he plays a ball. And that's what led to that raccoon incident on that May evening, a game that my co-host draft Nick Mark was actually at. And he said at that game, sitting in the outfield after a play before oh, the, the Diamondbacks game, right? Yes. Yeah, the I inning, remember he was there. 
yeah, immediately before the fight happened, the half inning, there was a ball in between McNeil and Lindor, and McNeil got a glove on it in front of Lindor, booted away, and allowed the man to get on base. And Lindor turned around and just screamed curses, the top of his lungs, audible in the entire stadium, something that you only have to be there to realize. So I just think that the communication between those two kind of broke down as the season went along, which was a big reason the Mets made such a push to acquire a new second baseman. And you can also see Francisco Lindor's play kind of get better when he wasn't sharing the uh, the middle of the infield with Jeff McNeil. And that's something that I think, while it's it hard to bear that out, like like factually with statistics, it, it is something that happened, and I think that's meaningful. Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right because uh, what I've been saying all along too, because we've had a lot of divides since I first started talking about this. Um, originally reported from our good friend Pat Regazzo was that you know the Met when you look at the Mets and when you look at how they've operated this offseason I said this already in the live stream I'll say it again is that since Billy Upper has come in you know player valuation wise if he wasn't here I still think Javi Baez is a New York Met I still think Marcus Stroman is even a New York Met potentially because this is so much more than just what they previously did this past season and what regardless on what people's stances are on their character there were clearly things that made the Mets feel that, okay, this isn't necessarily worthy of going out of our way to do a long-term commitment or something along those lines. And when you look at all the acquisitions that they made at this point, don't get me wrong. They're really, when you get Max Scherzer, best pitcher outside Jacob DeGrom, plenty could argue. When you get Sterling Marte, huge get in that outfield, even at his age, Mark, Mark Canna, um, Escobar, et cetera. All these guys outside being great talents, they've been nothing short of uh they've been spoken glowingly by many people as great locker room presence great guys in the clubhouse on the field it's clear that the mets are trying to build a culture that wasn't there in 2021 because we all thought that you know this was a fun you know happy clubhouse especially the bench mob going to all these things it was a lot of fun but clearly it wasn't nearly as good as what we initially thought it was made out to be especially as the second half and that roller coaster just continued to go downward so i guess what i'm trying to say here is that it's easy for us Mets fans to just be committed to guys that have brought us success in the past. McNeil is nothing short of that. I fully expect him to have another upwards of 280 to 300 average hitter 2022 and beyond. I think that this year was an anomaly for him based on his injuries and also just everything going on with, you know, the hitting approach that was so abysmal for the Mets runners of scoring position, especially. So it's not the concern of whether he's going to bounce back or not in my mind, but rather he's just the proper fit for this Mets club. That's clearly seeming like they're going in a different direction and still have more holes that they like to address this roster. Definitely. I think Jeff McNeil is also a player who, while he performed incredibly well over his first three years in the major leagues, and did perform incredibly well. Like from 2018, to 2020, he played 250 games and had an 884 OPS and 140 WRC plus. Like that's, he was, that's he was disgusting. That's elite level. But he was a guy who has always kind of overperformed on both his projections and a lot of his expected statistics based on the uh, the quality of his balls in play. And last year, while a lot of those stats remained somewhat level, especially his exit velocity on line drives and fly balls, his production fell now below where his expected stats were. So I think there is still a Jeff McNeil who can exist in between where his projections will lie but we just had i don't think that we can really ever expect us or any other team in baseball to see the jeff mcneil who was one of the better hitters in the whole league again rather this will be a guy who is just comfortably above average so better than the guy who we saw last year but not quite the guy who we saw in 2019 especially when there was the crazy baseball and everyone was hitting home runs yeah, no, exactly. And I, I think when you look at how things have transpired from 2018, 2019 to now, there was a great article I just read a couple days ago through The Athletic that broke down potentially, uh, you know, bounce back candidates for 2022. And from Eno Saris. Yeah, yeah, from McNeil being one of them. And uh, one of the most important pieces I saw from that was the note of how McNeil is being shifted, you know, 50 times I, more. I wrote that on my notes. Like, and, and that and that's and that just shows you how important you know shifting is in the game of baseball right now, as we all know by now. It's it's frustrating as all hell when it doesn't go your way, but when it does go your go your way defensively, it's perfect, right? But that that's a great example of okay, this is probably something that the Mets are using as well in their thought process here, potentially with Jeff, because you know Jeff, who knows how to spread the field, was very pull happy from the eye test at least in 2021. Someone that I my natural concerns with him as a fan without going into numbers, especially before I came, became a content, content creator was it seemed like he wanted to have more pop in his bat, you know, a big golfer, more of a golf swing, especially slow start to the 2020 season. And then he got in a rhythm still over three, three ten average, had a very solid shoring campaign, but you could tell that once he got that taste of 20 home runs, 
it seemed like his approach was always just a little bit different and doing more than what you would expect from Jeff McNeil or really what his role is. And that was something that bothered me a little bit. We saw a lot of it in 2021, I felt like, which it led to him only having a handful of uh, uh, home runs as it was. But, you know, between the shifting being the way it is now and teams really catching up to speed with him, it's going to be up to him, obviously, at the end of the day, if he's going to be able to avoid the shift, if he's going to be able to spread the ball better than what he has in just 2021 or even in 2020 at times. So what's your take on McNeil and really how defense alignments have been and negative towards him right now? And what do you personally think is the likelihood of him being able to overcome that? Or if you think that's actually one of the bigger factors into why the Mets feel that parting ways with him, given where his value is at now, even though it's lower than it ever is before, still might be the best route to go with three years left on his contract. Boy, that was an absolutely fantastic question. But I think that it's interesting <laughs> that you bring up the fact of like eye test versus what statistics bear out. Because if you actually look at Jeff McNeil's percentages of where he puts the ball in play, last season was that he actually had the highest opposite field hit rate of his entire career. See, and, the, and the lowest, and the lowest pull percentage, exactly, since his rookie season. So that's a little bit peculiar. And that article that Eno Saris wrote, he kind of went into how teams are shifting McNeil. And it's not exactly how I think that we all think of the term shift. And when we think as baseball fans, modern of shifts we think of the classic shift of the second baseman deep in the hole the shortstop over the bag third baseman playing shortstop like that's the shift yep. but mcneil specifically his shifts were a little bit more centered around him hitting the ball in the opposite direction that's a place where jeff mcneil has gotten a lot of hits early in his career and eno saris in the article specifically said that third baseman against jeff mcneil still stay in the third base range and actually play on average six feet deeper than they do him against him otherwise and left fielders on again that same field against jeff mcneil play about five to six feet inward so that right there shrinks the amount of space that jeff mcneil has to get hit to the opposite field a place that he really uh used a lot early in his career and i think that's very interesting because i don't know if baseball savant necessarily picks up all of those shifts that happen because Je last season jeff mcneil has a higher woba against the shift than not against the shift so for most baseball fans will see that be like all right there's still the same all fields jeff mcneil we don't have to worry about the shift but I do think that there is a fear and trepidation probably among Mets fans and people in baseball in general about Jeff McNeil's ability to bounce back to, again, those pre-2021 levels because now teams seem to be more effectively shifting against him rather than just shifting more. And this is a guy who was never shifted against. He was less than 10% shift rate when he was a rookie and even less than 20% 2019 when he went crazy. The fact that he is still putting the ball to all fields and his shift rate is above 50%, shows me that other teams around baseball know something that maybe us fans can't exactly see. And if you watch Jeff McNeil last year, you could see so many times that he put a ball in play that found a glove that you really didn't think should. Oh, like, he, had, he had some of the most unlucky so many throughout the season. 100%. And you can see how that wears on him emotionally and how he really wears his anger on his face every single at bat. Oh, if he doesn't yell an F-bomb after he's yeah. out, you know, something's wrong. It's hard to be a baseball player and act like that because if you're getting out seven out of ten times, you're one of the best players in baseball. So I do think that there is a general fear, both internally with the Mets and externally with other teams in baseball, that something about Jeff McNeil has been figured out. And I think while playing his home games in the ballpark like City Field that suppresses exit velocity and it's very difficult for left-handed hitters and all hitters really to hit home runs, we're never really going to be able to see Jeff McNeil take this gigantic step forward that Mets fans had hoped he would. And I do think that is playing in to this, these tra this trade speculation. And I think it also shows us more on the Mets from 2019, their great offensive production, but how Steve Cohen and everyone involved has kind of quickly realized, especially after everything possibly going wrong this past season, that, you know, we shouldn't be putting as much stock into 2020, uh, 2019 and having the juice balls era into what can we expect? Because I think it's also important too when you look at McNeil, like, again, I've absolutely loved the guy's entire career, but when you look at his production, he's also someone that up until 2021, other than that, out of his three seasons, only one of them, he played, you know, at least for the uh, majority of the season, 133 yeah. games, rookie year, 63 games, of course, short year 2020 wasn't his fault. But the point being is that this is a very small sample size still for someone who has exceeded expectations like no tomorrow when he first came out. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the Mets go into 2022 with him, and if there is a scenario, not that I hope and I do think he will bounce back, but if they go in, into 2022 and there's still say some issues between either him and Lindor or just defensive alignment and also offensive production, and that's another year that you lost down potentially trained Jeff McNeil. 
And for a team that's in a win now stage, I think that they're honestly trying to eliminate as many, uh, you know, what ifs as possible. They want certainties now, right? Over the over these next two, three years. And Jeff McNeil, who's someone that I do think is is as close to a certainty as possible as having a bounce back season, it's not a guarantee. And I think they realize that too. And they also realize the market for him as a report from Pat and Michael Mayer originally indicated that multiple teams have shown a lot of interest in Jeff. So if that's holding true, like why wouldn't you try to execute now, even with his value at his lowest? Because in reality, if his value is say higher next season, well, yeah, you're probably not going to deal him. That's a different situation. That means that everything sorted itself out, but that's something that the Mets are willing to maybe not risk right now in hopes that they can address this rotation. So when you're looking at Jeff McNeil and potentially his market, do you think it's best for the Mets to say part ways with him to land a middle of the rotation starting pitcher? Or do you feel that it's still worthy or a better idea, if you will, to go in the Frasian market? Like, I know you're probably not huge on Carlos Rodon because he's so boomer bust. I mean, I don't know. I'm going to find out in a second. Um, but what's your take on the Mets addressing this rotation? Do you think that McNeil is that key to get a solidified number three? Or do you think that they may very well be better off elsewhere and just going in for agency? I think that... Jeff McNeil is a fascinating player for a lot of reasons, and a big one is because of how late he came up to the major league. Jeff McNeil was a 26-year-old rookie. So usually when you talk about a guy who has three or four seasons under his belt, he's in his mid-20s. Jeff McNeil, on the other side of that, is going to be turning 30 years old the next year. And not that's a bad thing. Not that 30 years old is a, is like a dirty word. That's still basically in the back end of your prime for a baseball position player. Isn't Scarley Marte like 34? Yeah, but Starry Marte is a freak of nature. You see that guy's arms? Oh. Like I don't, I don't know what that guy eats, but or what his no. workout regimen is, yeah. but I want it. <laughs> but Jeff McNeil, there's just really good reason to think that his physical prime is probably completed, especially by the fact that he has dealt with a few soft tissue injuries, and he had never really been much of a prolific power hitter anyway. Well, he's had good power at certain times in his career. He has not, so it's kind of difficult to gauge his offensive value, but – this is why he's such a peculiar guy to trade and why I think this take that's gone around Mets Twitter a lot is a little bit lazy that you're trading Jeff McNeil to the bottom of his value. I don't think there's any real guarantee that this guy will ever gain more value unless he has a mammoth season. But in that case, something similar like you said, then you're definitely not trading him. And while that is possible, I don't believe it's likely. You look at a guy like McNeil again, turning 30 years old. This is his first year where he's arbitration eligible. So going forward, he's only going to become older and more expensive. You, If you do want to trade him at all, it would behoove you to do it while he has the most team control possible, which is right now. He's probably going to make three-ish million arbitration next year, maybe six-ish the year after that, and between eight and ten, depending how these years go after that. So you're looking at a guy who's going to be on like a three-year contract between 12 and $17 million at the worst-case scenario. That in itself makes him almost more tradable than any production he has had or will have in the future. The fact that you're getting a guy who can play multiple positions defensively at a high value and hit better than league average for incredibly cheap. That's where his value comes from, and that's why I don't think he's a guy. If they do want to trade him at all, holding him doesn't make any sense. This is the best time to trade him. The iron is hot. And it's not because he had such a bad year last year and it kills his value, but because he does have that extra year of team control right now in a, in a cheaper season. Like this one year for $3 million worth of Jeff McNeil will probably be the most valuable he'll ever be, potentially in the rest of his career, unless some, there's a major adjustment that's made and something crazy happens. And so, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm saying so. I was going to just end there. But like, if you're going to do it, and this is probably the best asset you're going to get back right now, or the best way you can position him with other assets to get something else back. No, you're absolutely right. And I think it's important for us fans to realize exactly what you just said, because on the forefront, when you th when you think about things broadly, you look at McNeil and you say, hey, he did have a down year. OK, why would you part with him now? I got so much flack mm -hmm. because a couple months ago I came out with a video saying like five players, I think, won't return. And I had McNeil as one of them. I said, I don't want to see him go. I just think that there's a strong possibility it'll happen. And everyone's like, no, why would he make zero sense? But at the end of the day. Exactly to your point, when you look at his ability, his versatility as contract, I think a lot of fans don't seem to realize just the importance of club control. That's something that's a huge X factor. You know, when I looked at, I was working on a video today that had to do with a, a couple of pitchers that one of them is on the thumbnail, you know, that being Shamanaya, for example, those are guys that are rentals, right? So that's the biggest factor in landing them without necessarily having to give up an arm and a leg. The fact that you there is that uncertainty on the market at where they are in their career versus, say, landing a guy that just has one or two more years of control. That's huge for guys that have similar production. Definitely. And I think that gets a little bit lost 
on some fans sometimes when you look at trade value again because like if you're playing fantasy sports and you're playing MLB the show like you see a guy who had a bad year that's like a classic buy low you can like beat the trade algorithms in your games and you can get these guys but I don't really think that's how major league baseball teams are really evaluating players again either on the Mets or elsewhere like everyone can see these teams all use projections more so than they're taking in stats from the old times like no one's looking at Jeff McNeil's batting average and RBIs from 2019 is his trade Thank value you. going down. These teams are looking at how they're valuing him in the future, where these incredible statisticians, their own Ben Zausmers, are projecting a guy like Jeff McNeil to be valuable next year and how well they think he's going to hit the ball. And that is why his value right now, I think, is while it's higher than some Mets fans think, I think there are a lot of people who are still overrating his value a little bit, thinking that he can be traded for simply for guys like Frankie Montes and Luis Castillo, guys who are really in the upper echelon of pitching. We had this conversation yesterday. I think it's a very peculiar conversation about trading Jeff McNeil because people are at the same time, it feels like too high and too low on him. And you have to be able to find that middle point. And even with finding that middle point, it's incredibly difficult to find an actual trade partner for the Mets because most teams who would covet Jeff McNeil's skill set don't exactly have pitchers that they'd be very willing to trade because Pitching is a valuable commodity in Major League Baseball, and everyone needs more of it than they have. And as we were originally talking about yesterday, too, and I gave you the shout out in tomorrow's video, so people be aware of that. Um, Thanks, but regarding uh, the Mets and type of deals they could potentially do, it's important to look at how McNeil, while he's valuable, yeah, there, I, there isn't a world where I could see Jeff McNeil one for one being a Luis Castillo. Like, there, it just, it's not going to happen. No way. And that's, and that's something where, even though that they are looking at how he's going to project, you still have to keep in mind his role on the club as it is. Even if Jeff McNeil had a, say, 310-plus average season and was all over the place, when you look at how much actual production he brings for your club versus an ace for a team that's in his prime, they still don't compare. They really don't. And uh, I think another good example would be someone like a Adam Frazier, who I know you absolutely love so much, right? Um, <laughs> Frazier, who was a hot commodity at the trade deadline, went to the Padres, did not do well. I advocate for him. I know that you and Mark were on the other spectrum, and, and in hindsight, you guys were right to this point. But Frazier, 300-plus average here this year, um, you know, definitely a big contact guy, had little to no power, has none to this point. But even though he doesn't have that same versatility, the point being is that there's a lot more that goes into just being a high average hitter. And a lot of them, when you look at McNeil, he has yet to really solidify himself as a everyday second baseman, um, you know, for years on end. He's only played second base for right around just half as much as he has for every other position. So while it's definitely nice to see him be this versatile, it also shows you that there's just there's still uncertainties with him and his future. And teams are weighing all those pros and cons. So when you're looking at what his market is availability wise, I think why Jeff McNeil makes a lot of sense too is for a Mets team that doesn't want to part ways with all their top prospects. They're not going to give up the farm. They're building through free agency, which I love. That's how you build teams that have continued success like the Yankees, like the Dodgers, et cetera. But outside of that, they might be willing to say part with one other top five prospects along with a Jeff McNeil, if that's their X factor. If you can do that instead of giving up, say, what would be the asking price of a Francisco Lavarez at Brett Beatty, depending on who you're looking for, then you do it because you know that in free agency, potentially you could fill the void of Jeff McNeil. There are multiple infield options, bigger names that maybe you overpay for, but you know that production wise, they're going to give you what you're looking for. And it, it's not going to, as long as it doesn't hurt the Mets with their financial flexibility, that's truly all that matters to me. As long as you can make a deal happen that benefits both sides, that's important because a lot of people are viewing that this could be a Daniel Murphy situation, a Justin Turner situation. And I get it. Those are two guys that the Mets did not evaluate properly, or at least Justin Turner's case, especially really blossom elsewhere. Murphy though was on that right after the playoffs, as we know, and then him and Alderson just couldn't get a deal done. And of course he goes to nationals. I, I just, I can't, I can't get over that. I really can't. But point being is that the context is different with Jeff McNeil. He's not someone you should compare to a Daniel Murphy, like a Justin Turner, because I think you'd be a fool to suggest that Jeff McNeil is not going to bounce back. I expect him to bounce back. I, I wish him nothing but the best. I hope he thrives even uh, as long as hopefully it's out of the division, wherever he would potentially be dealt to. But the point I'm trying to make is that as long as that this is a trade that truly benefits both sides, where it's a win-win, this isn't an LOL Mets situation. So the Mets are going to be strategic. I don't see them even considering the thought of partnering with McNeil unless they're really gaining a return that makes so much sense in addressing the rotation and potentially even that infield spot too. I know there's really only one team that makes sense there, but what's your what's your take on all of that? 
I think that you bring up the Adam Frazier trade, and I think another similar one was the Joey Wendell trade that sent Wendell from the Rays to the Marlins. And you look at what both of those guys got back in trades, it was a slew of minor leaguers. Uh, the Padres got two minor leaguers back, kind of mid-level guys from the Mariners in exchange for uh, Adam Frazier, and the Marlins in exchange for Joey Wendell sent the Rays, a former first-round pick, a guy named Karen Meisner, who was about 30% better hitter than league average in AA last year as a 23-year-old. So... Those aren't really very enticing returns, but Jeff McNeil is, of course, better than those guys. But just that, I want to drive home the point that it'd be easy to trade Jeff McNeil for equal value if you the Mets were not exactly contending or willing to get back prospects or minor league pieces. The fact that they seem steadfast in looking for pitching for Jeff McNeil, it might make this return seem less appetizing in the eyes of Mets fans, just because similarly to exactly what you just said about sending Jeff McNeil off and replacing him with a free agent option from the infield, all the other teams that would want to trade for Jeff McNeil could very easily do that too. It's much easier to figure out second or third base or corner outfield than it is to figure out your number three star there. And I think that's exactly what the Mets are going through. And that's another reason that it's going to kill Jeff McNeil's trade value is because all these other teams know that as well. You could very easily, instead of trading for Jeff McNeil to play third base, sign Kyle Seager for like $8 million. He could do a pretty okay job there. You can give Chris Bryant the fourth year or the fifth year. You could sign, this guy already signed, but a guy like Cesar Hernandez, he's not exciting. It's not a sexy move, but you put him at second base and you keep your train moving. I think that is the biggest crux of this Jeff McNeil trade valuation situation. Of course, the one thing Jeff McNeil has that those two guys I mentioned don't have is that he plays multiple positions, and that's something that a lot of teams really do look for. It's a big re- big way that teams build their teams. Teams build their teams with a crazy sentence. <laughs> if you look at the benches of the Giants, the Dodgers, the Rays, three of the smartest, best teams in baseball, Nobody over there plays one position. You have a guy in your team like Jeff McNeil or look like Chris Taylor or Joey Wendell who can play four or five positions on the diamond. You're now opening up bench spots to get more guys who do more things. That can make your roster incredibly better in just a very short, small period of time. So that's why it's even every single thing that goes against Jeff McNeil's value, there's something else that puts it up. And this, again, makes this conversation so incredibly difficult and why in the back of my head, I still do think the Mets are going to be able to get at least a somewhat meaningful starting pitcher for him. Well, not be sexy or something that Mets fans really love or excited about at first, unless you add a guy who you didn't mention, but you were circling the drain on Ronnie Mauricio before, that it will could be something that does actually make this team better in the short term. Yeah, absolutely. And when you look at, you know, prospect-wise, as I said already, again, if the Mets are in a spot where they don't have to part with a lot of their bigger names, but they can just give up one where someone like Mauricio, as an example, you know, just using him as a hypothetical right now, where he does not have a future on the club if we're basing things solely on position. Again, that, of course, can change. Maybe even is someone that can either shift to third or second, however they want to go about it. But as of now, he's blocked for the future. And that's why he's always been a name of consideration that would make sense if you're going to trade him. It makes sense to do it rather sooner than later, especially if he can be that if he can be that X factor in a deal to land you an ace or land you someone that would be an ace on opposing clubs was your number three, then by all means, go ahead and do it. So I, I like that balance. And I will say one point that you made regarding how other teams can address uh, their second and third base through free agency. I will say, I don't agree that to the same extent that you said it, because depending on what teams that the Mets would potentially part McNeil to, whether it's of course a team like Oakland or maybe a team like Cincinnati or even you know a team like the Brewers you know hint hint at tomorrow's video uh the point I'm trying to make is that these are all teams that aren't in the same big market so when you're looking at those bigger names like say a Chris Bryant like a Trevor Story that's where the Mets come into play because they they simply can just pony up the money as long as they want as long as that's something that they want to do that's not going to be a problem all these other teams have those issues to address their infield so yes there are other infield options besides those two I'm well aware Uh, The point I'm trying to make is that basing things on where the position the Mets are in right now, market wise, they automatically have that, you know, they have that upper hand, if you will. They can sacrifice losing a McNeil knowing that they can just go out and spend right away. And naturally, they're probably not even going to second guess it for a team that's trying to win starting in 2022. Definitely. And to flip that again to how these other teams would view a potential trade, if you look at specifically the A's and the person on the thumbnail, Sean Manai, he's going to be due about 9 or $10 million next season. You, If they can send out him for a guy like Jeff McNeil, he's only going to be due three. That's a net $7 million gain for the Oakland Athletics, a team that very much values every single dollar that's in play for them. And then they could turn around and sign their old friend Jed Lowry or sign a friend to the Bay Area, Donovan Solano, Josh Harrison. 
guys like Jonathan VR, our friend, Matt Duffy. Like there are those cheap options who you could use at second base and third base while still maintaining a general level of competitiveness that you just probably will not be able to at pitcher was kind of the, the point I was making there. Oh, okay. I got, I got you for sure. Yeah. Solano's like the, repla- gonna, the replacement levels higher. Just going completely, you know, left field here. Solano is a name that awfully intrigues me for like a weird reason. And I think, I think it's just the giants, you know, making something out of nothing, at least guys that, you know, you didn't know of until this past season. Cause if you look at the Solano's or the roughs of the world, they just made everyone work their utilization for how they had their players in different positions and, uh, you know, mid game to late game adjustments, uh, d- defensive position, everything was just stellar. So what, what's your take on him for a minute? I think he's a good bat. I don't know if Donovan Zolano is going to be the everyday second baseman on a playoff team, but I think Donovan Zolano is a guy who would help any team's roster. Again, he's a guy who you could the Mets can sign if Jeff McNeil were to theoretically be, get traded. He's, he's suddenly platooning with Eduardo Escobar, Robinson Cano, and J.D. Davis, everyone mixing in at second and third base besides Davis and playing second base, but basically four guys playing two positions. And you're probably going to get similar value to – a full season worth of Jeff McNeil, specifically at those positions. Jeff McNeil is giving you more value because he has the ability to fill in at other positions, namely the outfield. But he's a guy name who I think could be very useful to a major league team, especially the Mets. Just again, because you get you get a semi-reliable bat at a position where hitting is not usually something that these guys do very well, second base. Yeah, no, no, that's a great point as well. But before we go any further, I just want to shout out everyone that's been watching the live stream at this point, live or on replay. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate that. Help us get a 300 likes by the end of the stream. Also, make sure to check out James on Twitter. His name is uh, Jeter Had No Range. Perfect name, as always. And make sure to check out the Mets Up podcast if you guys have an array with James and Giraffe Neck Mark. Uh, great friends on the channel for sure. I want to address just two donations quick before we go further. Matthew, thank you so much for the $2 donation. Really appreciate that, my man. I know you've been a big supporter on the channel for a while. And now this is a good transition to potential trade possibilities. Independent Outsider, thank you so much for the dono. I don't want McNeil trade, but I realize it is the McNeil fan and not the logic in me. Interesting. Okay. What would you need in players to trade him? Okay. See, this is what I like because I think when I talk about players on the forefront, because I can't answer every comment as it is in the comment section and stuff. And everyone always jumps to conclusions. Uh, sometimes I answer people because they think, oh, why would you, why are you insinuating that you want to see Jeff McNeil trade or something like this? When I'm just reiterating a report, when I go out of my way, I'm saying, I actually don't want him traded, but I'm just saying like, it's important to be a realist at the end of the day. What reg- Put your emotions aside. We have to understand that there are going to be players the Mets naturally part with that maybe we're not okay with at first, or maybe that on the forefront you're wondering, does this even make sense? In reality, I do think it will. I trust Billy Big Bucks. I think Epler's done a great job in position uh, so far. I wonder what your take is on him too. But before we go further, I just want to ask, what has your overall look on the um, – the off season in a nutshell been so far like are you surprised or was this all expected for you like what's your take i thought the mets were going to spend money but i'm kind of shocked at the way they spent it like i thought the three three friday night signings between Marte canna and escobar were very those were very traditional mets moves where they were all guys who were signing for not affordable rates but for i think rates that were just at about market value things that were pretty coherent you could tell that there was some like good thought in it they weren't really trying to break the bank trying to spend money and three guys weren't going to be superstars but three guys who were going to be able to um fit into this roster next year and be like very clear and definite improvements over what previously was there the Scherzer thing sent me to the moon I mean I think I hope you probably listen to the messed up that Mark and I yeah <laughs> that's pretty sick yeah. the eyes holy crap <laughs> you probably <laughs> listened and, uh, if anyone out there hasn't listened me and Mark we did um the night that Scherzer signed we we got we basically just celebrated we went to a bar in Queens oh my we god that was the, that was that yeah. was the perfect pod we did a 1 a.m to 2 a.m recording just basically pretty drunk just being happy about the Mets breaking the bank for the first time basically in our adult lives so I was definitely shocked. We also did that crazy live stream on Spaces that got up to like 5,000 yeah, uh, awesome. viewers. That was not so stuff. But that part shocked me, and that did give me a lot more confidence in Billy Epler, Billy Stacks, than I did going into the offseason just because I looked at those Angels rosters that he was putting together for years there on Rodney Moreno, and I was just like, this is not – coherent work like even Marty someone Marino. i said yeah. that i said that a mark from day one i'm like trust in steve cohen it's just marino i promise you 
But again, like there were some mi- mo- like very middling, even the big contracts he gave out, the medium contracts he gave out, the small contracts he gave out. You looked yeah. at those Angels rosters between 2015 and 2019, and you're like, who the hell is on this team? Mm-hmm. Like every, they were running out nonsense players at every single position. Those rotations were horrific. They were the stuff of nightmares. So I was worried, but I guess now with an unlimited bankroll, I'm pretty happy with Billy Epler's done. But this is the real test. It's easy to sign a guy like Max Scherzer or Starling Marte, guys who you know are proven commodities. But now when you have to make a nuanced move and trade a guy who is something of a fan favorite, who has a little bit of a has a little bit of a difference in valuation probably across the league, people internally and externally, a phrase I've used a lot in this uh, show, that is where you really make your bones as a general manager. And I'm very excited to see how Epler handles this. I am too. And, you know, I, I don't know exactly when the lockout's going to be lifted. We all hope it's soon, obviously. But... One thing's for certain, the Mets are nothing short. They're not done at all. And to see how they're going to address things, not still, not just in the free agent market still, but also looking on how they're going to go about the trade market, it's exciting. And now when you look at exactly Jeff McNeil, I'm going to try not to spoil too much for tomorrow's video, but when you think about Jeff McNeil and his potential suitors, what teams stand out to you? And what do you think is potentially the most realistic ever basing things on just himself and then we'll pivot to what i think is maybe a little bit more realistic because i quite frankly don't see jeff mcneil being traded unless it's more than just jeff mcneil i i agree with that take and i do think that if you're going to go fishing you might as well go for a big fish so if you're going to be trading pieces anyway you might as well put as many pieces you can together and get as good of a player as you can but i see the teams going after jeff mcneil are the teams that try to compete on the cheap And there is some question as to whether some of these teams will still be trying to compete next year. And the three teams that come to my head first are the Oakland Athletics, the Cincinnati Reds, and Milwaukee Brewers. These are three teams who, well, two teams specifically in the Reds and the A's who are clearly taking a step back this offseason. But they're two teams who have not been willing to go all the way down into the shits over the last couple of years. Like they're not under Billy B and the A's have never fully torn it down. They love to keep their team hanging out in a mildly competitive spot between like a 75 and 80 win projection, see how they start and then see whether they should buy or sell once the deadline comes. And I think Jeff McNeil is a perfect guy to do that because he's going to be a clear improvement over the worst guy in that lineup. He could either slot in as their second baseman, their left fielder or their right fielder and play pretty well for them. We know they have a big hole in uh, left field now with Mark Hanha leaving, same with center field with Marte leaving. But I think those teams who would really covet a versatile player who makes $3 million, who do have, a little bit of pitching to trade, not a lot, not the sexiest names in the world, but there are guys on those teams who make sense, especially the A's and the Reds, because Sean Manaya, Chris Bassett, and Sonny Gray are all on one-year contracts right now. Well, Sonny Gray has a club option, but he, to a team, at worst case scenario, is on a one-year contract. And a one-year contract for around 10 to $12 million, exchanging that for three years of a player who's going to be worth a little bit more than that over the life of that deal, that is what would make the most sense from another team's perspective, I think. And I'm glad he brought up Sonny Gray because we let's expand on him for a little bit because he's the one guy I actually didn't talk about in the video. So I want to deep dive him a little bit because a lot of Mets fans have the belief with Sonny Gray, especially that, oh my goodness, you know, he did so poor with the Yankees. He can never do well in a big market. I hate that take so much because if you look at how everything transpired, you know, there was a clear uh, misutilization with how he was going about his sliders, especially when he was with the Yankees. And a lot of people don't mention that something that Sonny was adamant about especially after you left uh, the Bronx. So I do think that he would be fine just well. I don't know exactly statistically how much he shapes up uh, to someone like Marcus Stroman, but I do see similarities in their game a little bit and what he could provide for the middle of the rotation. I don't think he's going to pitch anything less than, say, you know, at best a three-and-a-half-year Ray. But he's probably that one guy where I do think that there is a pretty strong possibility that the Reds would consider right around a one-for-one or maybe throwing in some type of prospect that's outside of the top 10 for the Mets. Because when you look at Gray's value as a rental and you look at McNeil for the Red, McNeil just looks like he would be perfect for the Reds. And I know you're wondering, does that even make sense with Jonathan India, their stud who grew up a dire Mets fan, by the way. So I absolutely love him at second base for them. But McNeil is someone that can slot in potentially right field with Castellanos gone. And you'd have to imagine he would thrive in that hitter's park. You know, they, every barrier is so well there. So I think him on that deal for a Reds team that doesn't know what the hell they're doing. They never want to go fully all in. They always are kind of looming and that retool slash rebuild type stage. And they're doing it again this offseason. So one for one, I think that's actually probably one of, if not the most realistic route, if you're basing things on just for McNeil alone without going deeper and going after a bigger fish. I do think that, 
Sonny Gray does make sense for McNeil, but you have to remember that Sonny Gray does have that club option. So I think a team like the Reds, who now he is pitching better than a $12 million pitcher would on the open market. So you have to now think that he basically is on a two-year, $25 million deal. And Sonny Gray also has one of the funniest contracts in baseball, to go on a little bit of a tangent here. He oh. has hilarious um, in like a um, boost on his contract. Sonny Gray specifically in his contract has MVP boost. If he wins an MVP this year, he gets a $2 million bonus on his deal for next year. Which <laughs> for Sonny Gray's agents to have negotiated an MVP bonus for him is just so funny in retrospect, but he is a guy who he is going to get flack in this discussion because people don't think he can pitch in New York. You mentioned that the Yankees kind of screwed up his repertoire a little bit when he came here. They did the same thing to Lance Lynn. They've shown not to be as good with developing, um, Already major league pitchers that they I'm have already Rob major Lynn. league hitters. That he yeah, over my head. Same. If the Yankees would have just kept both those guys, they probably have a World Series ring in 2018 <laughs> or 19, and they would have done the right things with them. But he is someone who would I think benefit a lot from pitching in a ballpark like City Field because Sonny Gray. I'm gonna check this before I say it, but I think. Actually, no, Sonny Gray is a big, big ground ball guy. He only gives up 22% fly ball. So Great American Ballpark's not that bad for him. But still, City Field is like twice the size of Great American Ballpark. And Yankees take for on that subject anyway. And again, the Reds are looking to shed some salary right now and add a bat. The Reds are not a good hitting team. They haven't been really for a while, besides the shortened season, because they had a lot of guys who came on all of a sudden. And they don't really have an obvious fill-in for the outfield. Of course, they want to see Nick Senzel. They want to get him some reps. I feel he ever stays healthy. He's kind of, you know, been here, done that already. I I think that I think I I think they still have a lot of eggs in that basket. He's just never been healthy. He's always played well when he's played again. He just can't stay healthy. Winker's locked in in one spot, and then they do have a mix of Aristides Aquino, TJ Friedel, um, Shogu Akiyama. Those guys guys can't hit, and also um, who am I missing right now? Oh, Tyler Nakeen. But those still aren't like very obvious options that are better offensively than Jeff McNeil. It just becomes a cost thing at that point. And the Reds are willing to trade one of these pitchers and have flown around these rumors because they have just a fleet of young monsters coming up through the minor leagues. Just like their quadruple A guys right now, the guys fighting for their last few rotation spots, Tony Santian and Reaver San Martin are two big time sleepers this year. And then they have Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo in AAA who are both absolute animals we're both probably above average major league pitchers right now so a team like that could look at the Mets and Jeff McNeil and say we can afford to lose Sonny Gray and not really lose that much production put 10 million dollars in our pockets and then acquire Jeff McNeil who's an immediate upgrade in our corner outfield and I think you put all that together and it makes the Reds a pretty good spot to trade with because again they never like to tear the whole thing down they're still paying Joey Votto a lot of money they still have a couple elite players in that lineup with Votto, Winker and um and um, we just to Jonathan India, and they still have the borderline ace in Luis Castillo, a rising ace in Tyler Molly, and again a fleet of young pitching and a couple very sneaky bullpen arms. So there's a team in a very weak NL Central, probably could still compete for the playoffs this year, even without Sonny Gray in that roster. And that's why to me, they make probably the most sense. It's just not for Luis Castillo alone, like some Mets fans would want to hear. Yeah, exactly. And Castillo, I, I to expand on him for a minute here. I don't think he's impossible, and you'll you'll see me talk about him very soon, Mets fans. But I don't think that you land him without truly giving up like a lot. You know, there's I think about Jose Barrios back at the trade deadline, right? You give up it's the one that got give away. Up their, what's that? I said it was the one that got away. He was the one that got away. Seriously. But Barrios is someone who the Blue Jays give off their number two. I think it was number two in their number four prospects. One of them, of course, was the Mets' former prospect, Simone Woods Richardson. So I'm glad that uh, uh, Toronto was able to utilize him uh, to get that deal done. But I see a lot of comps between Barrios and Castillo. And especially with Castillo's market right now, it, there's just there's just no way to view someone who I think most people can agree is the best pitcher available on either the free agent or the trade market. Like it really isn't even that close. And I know that when you look at his 2021 campaign, yes, I know he had a sub for ERA. This guy had a seven plus ERA for like two months and got down to you know a 3.98. He has the nastiest changeup of a starter in all baseball, like 80 plus strikeouts this past season. He's just carving up the top teams in the league, like the Dodgers, etc. So. I think Castillo, if the Mets are going to go all in, if they are truly going all in for another top line starter, if you can make that happen, yes, you're going to give up a lot and I'll talk about it soon, but regardless of what you're giving up, that is as, as much of a win-win trade as, as any, in my opinion, for a team that's really trying to go like, imagine at least Castillo as your number three. 
Like, just think about that. Like that, it doesn't, you could literally, you could have JD Davis as your fifth starter for all I care at that point. Like that. Pitch a little bit. Exactly. <laughs> like you can really just have a three headed monster that as much as us Mets fans have seen great pitching in recent years, that could take it to another level, which is just insane. Even think about. So what's your take on Castillo? What's, your take on the likelihood or unlikelihood of him being traded this offseason because the Reds are just they're so annoying. They they one minute they're like, hey, you know, we're 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 all in, you know, we're willing to listen. Then another minute we're getting reports saying that, oh, you know, now they're not interested because you know when they're not getting the moon. And I, I don't blame them for wanting anything less, not wanting anything less uh, than the moon. But what's your take on all of that? I think that the Reds are an infuriating team to look at from the outside because if so they were will, if they're willing to just put like thirty or forty million into this team like over the next few weeks, like not next few weeks, few weeks after the lockout ends, like if they went out and were like, we're gonna sign Kyle Schwarber, like um, Tommy Pham, and like McConfort though, and then they put them as like those are the three outfielders that went around Winker and Senzel, like this is suddenly one of probably the favorite to win that division while not trading any of these pitchers. And which is insane to think about because the yeah. Brewers, like the Brewers are just so star studded. The Brewers are the same too. If the Brewers signed those three guys too, they would also be in the same conversation. They'd exactly. be a hundred they'd be a hundred win team. It's just now that the now that we're rich, we can look at all these poor teams and be like, why don't you guys spend more money and get better? It doesn't make any sense to me. But just as a callback, we we're talking about you know Saris's article before. I I've taken this term from him. I am a stuffist when it comes to pitching. When I want my pitchers, I want them to have the nastiest stuff in the world. And however bad Luis Castillo's stats seem from the surface level last year. His advanced still, numbers don't. They, 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 they're still not as good as he was in previous years, but his stuff is still so damn good. And a big thing that hurt Castillo was the fact that the Reds tried to experiment with Eugenio Suarez at shortstop last year. The Reds, again. That's a great point. Glad you brought they, that up. They cheaped out in every way they could. They cheaped out last year so much, they literally didn't have a shortstop on their active roster. Eugenio Suarez, who's an average third baseman by all accounts in the field, was playing shortstop for a month. And Luis Castillo has the high, had the highest ground ball rate in all of baseball last year, over 50%. So there, And I think I saw a stat from Jeff Zimmerman the other day on Twitter. He gave up 14 hits per nine innings over his first six starts of the season when Suarez was over there at shortstop. So a guy who gets as many ground balls, not as many, more ground balls than every other pitcher in baseball to have someone who's literally incapable of playing the most important defensive position behind them is just malpractice. And that was a big reason why he suffered so badly. And I think pitching, again, is also very mental. Like, you don't see the results that you're used to or that you want. It's going to hurt you over time. Luis Castillo struggled with command. He he kind of probably was squeezing the ball a little tighter because he was so worried about balls being put in play. He was more focused on Well, the balls kept guys. changing, too. Let's not forget yeah, that. Yeah, that's true, too. That was the factor. Another big thing with Luis Castillo, I learned this from all the pitching writing I did last year at Pitcher List. He started like all of his games last year in the cold through April and May. Unseasonably cold weather last year, the May Ohio Knights. Consistent 40 and 50 degree weather games. That hurts a guy a lot. It's hard to pitch in that weather. It's hard to hit in that weather. It's hard to do everything in that weather. But these are just little tiny things that can really add up when things aren't going well to cause you to have, again, like Luis Castillo, the worst season of his career. And I think it's kind of ironic that some Mets fans think we can trade Jeff McNeil for Luis Castillo because he's a buy low in a down year when you don't think that Jeff McNeil would be, should be a buy low in a down year. You know what I mean? Like Castillo's value is still incredibly high. Even though he didn't pitch that well last year, he still pitched a lot. Innings are more scarce than ever current in the major, the current baseball landscape. And he still has something inside of him to where you could see him blossoming through his late twenties and becoming an ace. So I think that, if any pitcher that's available right now in all of baseball, he's the guy I definitely want the most. And I do think it actually is possible for the Mets to go and get him. I do think it is too. Again, it's going to come down to the Mets ponying up, obviously a top prospect with McNeil and then some, it's going to, it's going to take a haul, you know, and it would take to, yeah, but I think it's important to a Castillo. I'm so glad he brought up the, the Auenio Suarez aspect because it makes me think of what would Marcus Stroman be like in 2021 if he had Ahmad Rosario and Todd Frazier on the left side of his infield. Like, let's be honest here. And this or if Todd Frazier was playing shortstop and JD Davis was playing third, like <laughs> that was basically what he had with uh, Eugenio Suarez at third and Mike Mustak at shortstop, Mike Mustak at third. So guys who couldn't really swing it. These he had the highest ground ball rate in all of baseball, number one highest. No one touched him as starting pitchers. It's just so shocking to me that. People wouldn't think that had a massive impact on his value over the full season. Yeah, and that's a great point. Looking at there's so much more that goes into it. 
besides the pitcher and their performance alone? You know, how are they performing exactly? What defensive alignment do they have behind them? How good are those defenders to begin with? Us Mets fans know very well bad defense in previous years, and that's why we're such heavy advocates for a complete opposite now. And that's why I rave about Lindor so much with everything with him going up and down this year. One thing that never faltered was his defense for the most part. I mean, for him to, in my mind, I thought he was the best defensive shortstop in baseball this year, or at least very close to. Uh, he's going to continue to be just that in his prime. So not to get on a tangent, in there but I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that stance and i do want to address there are a couple donations in here so i'm going to do that um then i want to talk about the oakland a's for a, a couple minutes and then you find we can just wrap things up with a q a yeah awesome okay uh lsd thank you so much uh, mad max equals over he's he's a braves fan so he's going to talk all the trash in the world he's a very he's very nice so big support on the channel he just loves to make these comments so i appreciate that compton no less hope you're doing well christian five dollar donation thank you so much i appreciate that off topic but relevant how toxic is marcelo zuna is he cano bad can we explore that money not far off okay christian thank you so much for the donation when i tell you right now the mets aren't even going to sniff the idea of marcelo zuna not a chance maybe maybe two years ago it wouldn't wouldn't surprise me really wouldn't surprise me now no chance the fact that they're the fact that they're not even sniffing the idea uh, i shouldn't say they didn't sniff the idea but the fact that they still didn't bring bias back bring stroman back i'm not that they i'm not comparing them to yeah. ozuna because what ozuna did was terrible my point is is that when you have people in the clubhouse characters that have had negative light shine on them for different reasons ozuna is on a different level you know what i mean like he's literally on the same level as you rolled as chapman's of the world the you know domingo hermans and i don't think the mets want anything to do with anything that could be remotely controversial for this roster i also will say i think the biggest reason javi bias didn't come back to the mets was money more so than character and clubhouse issues like the, the tigers blew him out of the water and gave him probably the worst contract that we've seen given out so far in this offseason i don't i think the mets were willing to bring him back at their price i think that is what changed. I think that's also another reason why they're still willing to part with Jeff McNeil. The fact that they're willing to completely buy back Javier Baez, but keep going. No, you're right. And regarding Baez too, because the Mets were interested in bringing him back, but you're right. It was a might thing. And that still tells you at the end of the day, if they weren't willing to commit long-term to him to that six years, then clearly they were prioritizing him, but only to a comfortable degree. Right. And something that's important too, when you look at the Jeff McNeil situation is, why did the Mets land Javi Baez at the trade deadline? You know, to put Javi as your everyday second baseman, pair him with Lindor. We saw how Lindor thrived. That could tell you, too, that the Mets got a great taste of what Lindor can do with someone that isn't Jeff McNeil. And I know that Baez is a little bit of an anomaly because he is such an amazing glove as he is. I'm going to really miss him not being in Mets uniform for that reason, in part with him just being so flashy and fun. But uh, what's kind of your take on, you know, the Mets? It kind of was a buildup throughout the year for them to not just land a bat at the trade deadline, but to land a bat for someone that the position is really covered when McNeil's healthy. So to go out of your way and do that and put McNeil in a spot to have to be in the corner outfield or a position of more uncomfortability a little bit, I think it tells you more so the bigger picture as to why everything has led to this point. Yeah, I think also at that point in the trade deadline, the Mets were very desperate being without Lindor for a while. So I think they were really, really focused on getting someone who could handle shortstop in the short term. Another reason why I don't think that Tigers contract was great, because I don't really know how well Javi Baez is actually and, and defensively a shortstop anymore. I think he's a much better second baseman. But I think that I, I do also think that they were pretty OK with moving McNeil off of that position. I think I think it all it all goes together. It really doesn't seem like the Mets have been running their team in a way that prioritized Jeff McNeil. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that one for sure. So regarding his market again and pitching wise, I want to touch briefly on Shamanaya because I would love a Shamanaya Chris Bassett. I think Chris Bass is so interesting just because he's only been a starter for a couple of years. So I think when you look at, you know, his shelf life on how his arm is going to hold up, I think he will continue to be a late bloomer. That's someone that very well could go into, you know, his mid to late thirties and thrive more than maybe other guys that would be in his position, mainly because he hasn't as, as much stress on his arm, but Manaya, he just feels like the most ideal fit for so many reasons based on his current value, being a rental based on being a Southpaw, but also being a guy that has been there, done that. He has shown enough in his career at this point that even though he's dealt with some injuries, as we know, no hitters are fun and all, but putting those to the side, he really feels like he checks off the boxes the best for what the Mets are looking for right now. And if they're trying to look for a trade partner, the A's obviously are that. 
So if you go for Chapman or not, Manaya out of all those pitchers, in my mind, just feels most realistic on what you'd have to cough up to get him in itself. Yeah, I do think that, again, this comes down to the A's being willing to compete next year and actually wanting a Jeff McNeil. That's step one, of course, and we don't know that. There wasn't enough time in the first offseason window to really have an idea of where the A's direction was heading. But I personally, I don't love Manai. I just don't really love his repertoire. I'm not a big fan of like guys who really just throw sinkers and change-ups. He has a curveball that's like kind of okay, but it's like kind okay. of near the bottom of the league in terms of movement. Like his just his pitches have kind of been trending downward movement wise over the last few years. He doesn't really have a, a like desirable repertoire. But like that being said, he still threw 170 successful innings last year, and that is something the Mets need. But I. I'd like Bassett probably a little bit more because I think his slider could potentially be one of the best pitches in baseball. But these two, they're they're both rentals that would imp- very vastly improve the Mets' chances to win next year. And that part of them is what I like. But Manai's a guy who, if we were looking at all the pitchers in baseball, I wouldn't pick him out of a lineup and be like, yes, here's my man. But if we're looking at the pitchers that are currently available to us right now, given the circumstances, I'm like, maybe he's necessary. You know what I mean there? Yeah, it's the context, you know, of everything. Yeah. Uh, given this, given the spot that the Mets are currently in, and they weren't in a stage where they're probably looking to address the rotation via trade right now to start winning in 2022, then yeah, I think it's a definitely different discussion because naturally rentals, you know, even though the Mets can surely pay pay them up, you don't necessarily know if they want to have a long term commitment with him or Bassett. So I can understand that, but where they are right now, again, it just it makes most sense with everything yeah. that's available. But again, if they're really shooting for the stars, something that they can do, it just I think it's more so up to the opposing teams at this point than I think it is the Mets because they have they they they're showing that willingness at this point. But the A's need to come to a full stance on if they're selling, are they going all in? Because you might as well, for the most part, knowing the amount of assets that they can get, starting with Matt Olson and then working your way down, right? And then if yeah. you're looking at the Reds, same exact thing. They're just a team where you don't know exactly what they're feeling most comfortable with. And I don't think that they know either, which is even no, more frustrating. I, I think the A's are probably in the same boat. That makes it hard. Like, I don't know. Like, are you staying in the middle? Are you going out? Are you going in? Like, I don't really know. But here's Jeff McNeil. He's not that bad. And, again, and the he, lockout puts them in a tough spot because if, it, if say, he does get lifted very close to the season, maybe it doesn't even go into spring training. Like, we don't know how long it's going to drag out. So assuming that there's a very short period of time of the offseason left, that's going to put further emphasis on teams having very little time to try to uh, sway either of these teams to have them selling when that's a lot of work to be done in a short period. And who knows exactly that's something that their A's and or the Reds want to commit to. Yeah. And on the inverse of that for the A's, I think a shortened lockout would actually push them into being more competitive next season because if they want to trade a Chapman and Olsen or a Montas, I'm sure that's a trade that would take much more time to be fleshed out, you know, because that's going to be like a pivotal franchise altering type of move some kind of move where you are putting your foot in the ground you are picking a direction whether it be sit in the middle go back or move forward a guy like Manai, they are going to be trading him and chris bassett i would i would wager by august 1st of 2022 so i'm sure that these ideas are already going around their heads and this is much less of a there's there's much less emphasis being placed on those trades and the trades of those other guys who are going to be more valuable and have more control. Also, especially because the A's just don't the A's don't really make big moves. The A's do small things. Four million dollars there, six million dollars there. Trade that prospect. Get this small prospect. Get that guy off the scrap heap. It's all tiny moves. And this Manai, a Manai for Jeff McNeil swap along with probably some kind of mid level prospect would play into the way they do often play, which is why I think him and Bassett do make sense. Bassett would probably cost a little bit more because I do think he's a little bit better. See, that's it's funny that you say that because I think that Bassett might actually cost a little bit less. Per the only reason why I say that is me just looking on the forefront of Manaya being a southpaw, and I know that yeah. those are a hotter commodity at times. But again, maybe, maybe I'm reading too much into it. That's just my take, and knowing that Manaya has had more longevity, and with Bassett, he's done great, but it's been over a very, it's been more of a short period of time as a starter. I, I think that the left-handed thing is more meaningful for a bullpen arm rather than a starter. Like I think that you could be okay. a team and have five righties or five lefties in your rotation, and it really doesn't mean that much on a day-to-day basis because you're not you're not really searching for matchups anyway in terms of lefty and righty. And there's no data that exists in the world that says that right-handed pitchers or left-handed hitters are better. It's nice to have a balance. You can give teams a little bit of different perspective. You can sw- you kind of force more strategy, get guys out of the lineup on certain days possibly, but it's not as much of a need. I just think that Bassett, again, just has 
slightly better stuff than Manai. Like Manai, he doesn't really his sinker is kind of weird. His curveball is kind of flat. Like he's dealing with he's only a few years away from a major arm injury, which is a little bit scary. Through 108 innings last year, up from 60, which is also a little bit scary in terms of future injury risk. Well, Bassett is a guy who has kind of less miles you lose as before on his arm in general. And he does at the end of the day have like above average pitches. Like he has things yeah. that move in ways that some of his off more teams stuff look is awesome. Yeah. Bassett is a crazy change up and his color is really good. He introduced a slider last year. That was nice. He's always like focused on a sinker, but he's been throwing less for four years in a row now. So I think that there's reason to think that, Chris Bassett's 2022 could be better than Sean Manai. But again, I think I think they're both fine options, and each of them would fill an absolute gargantuan need for this current Mets roster. Yeah, I think it's a completely different discussion if the Mets don't have Max Scherzer right now. And oh, they still lose Adam <laughs> Marcus Stroman. Scary. Like, yeah, it's scary, but that gives you a further priority on like, okay, you need to go all, like you have to do everything possible probably to get a Castillo or something to similar lines, which is again hard because there really isn't other options similar to Castillo given the market currently. So yeah, no, you're absolutely right. For what the Mets need right now, either of them would get the job done in my mind. But let's open it up before we wrap things up, folks. Let's do a little bit of a Q&A because I know a lot of you guys have been chomping at the bit for some questions to get answered. Again, if you haven't already, folks, please make sure to check out James uh, with Draft Nick Mark for the Mets podcast. Link's in the description as always, folks. Make new sure episode to tomorrow. Episode tomorrow. A new, new episode, episode tomorrow. tomorrow, yeah. A lot, I think a lot of content's coming out tomorrow. We got a video mm -hmm. on the channel tomorrow. Got a new episode tomorrow. Is it going to be on YouTube tomorrow, or is it going to be just Spotify first? It's going to be Spotify tomorrow. It'll be on YouTube the next day. Usually we're on a one-day kick because of Mark has a lot of videos to edit sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I don't blame him. Yeah, no, that's fine. Well, I'm looking forward to it no less. Um, is there any uh, specific topic that we didn't touch on here that you maybe want to throw out for people to check out? It's basically what we've talked about today, potential Jeff McNeil trades. We broke down a lot of his current and his future value and why he took such a step back in 2021. We also went a little bit deeper, things that you're, I'm sure, going to talk about in your video tomorrow because it's things that we talked about yesterday about specifically what teams we can expect to make trades with if we were going to trade Jeff McNeil and what those teams would be willing to give us back. And also we went like a little bit deeper on Ben Zausmer than we went today. So Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah, again, make sure to check out the pod, guys. Um, doing a great job over there. And we, of course, love Mark. He'll be on the channel again soon, I'm sure. Um, Alberto, thank you so much for the $5 donation. Just give me Brian Castillo. Let's go, Mets. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think that'd be awesome. Um, what's what's your take on KB? I'm sure you're someone that's probably not in love with him. But on my mind, I'm all for him as long as you don't go past five. I think yeah. if you can get him out of four, you know, five reaching a little bit, I think that works for the Mets with what they're trying to do right now. I think Chris Bryant has a remarkably stable skill set, and we've started underrating him as a fan base just because of he's gotten worse since he's been in the major leagues. But even at the place he sits right now, it still has a very good player. But Chris Bryant's never going to hurt you. Chris Bryant's going to walk a lot. He's going to hit the ball reasonably hard most of the time. He's going to give you at least average defense of the hot corner. He's going to be able to play the outfield when you're in a pinch. I just you can't you can't think about Chris Bryant as the MVP when he was 22 years old. You have to think of Chris Bryant as of quality major league baseball third baseman. I do think that there, he still has a lot of suitors because there are some teams like the blue Jays and the Mariners right now who have pretty obvious places to upgrade on their infield. But I, there's a world where I think that Chris Bryant does sign for somewhere in that three and four year range for a little bit higher of an AAV. And I think that could be a slam dunk for the Mets, whether they trade Jeff McNeil or not, if I'm being honest. And I think that making a, a record breaking deal with a Scott Boris client definitely helps a little, bit. a little bit, at least, right? Um, and kind of changing the narrative in a very short period of time. So I'm with you on that one. I, I think KB just checks off all the boxes for what has been openly said by Billy Epler, looking for guys not just with versatility, but that he loves guys that can play infield and outfield. I'm like, okay, I'm like, you're, you're literally, you, the writing's on the wall. We just got to read it, right? I think that's yeah. Chris Bryant at this point. Um, but we do have a couple questions. want to get to them for sure. Robbie Hyde, who's another great baseball content creator. Thank you so much for the donation, my man. I appreciate that. I would love for the Mets to get a lefty. I wonder if Mike Miner could uh, be a dark horse, low cost trade option. If you can't get Mania. Interesting. I haven't, I really haven't thought about Miner at all. Um, appreciate the donation again, guys, make sure to check out Robbie does great overall baseball content streams like this on all things MLB and breaking news. So make sure to check him out. What's your take on that? I like Mike Miner a lot. He's the guy who I talked about on the Mets Dub podcast from our trade deadline preview. He is someone who I think is perpetually underrated in baseball because, again, he's just not a sexy name. You're not he's, you're not watching Mike Miner in the playoffs. Mike Miner is not pitching game two of the World Series, but he is someone who 
is very useful. He strikes out more guys than you would think. He had that funny situation in 2019 where he had a 200 strikeout uh, bonus in his contract, and the <laughs> Rangers let a pop-up drop. And for what would have been his final out of oh, the those season, sons of bitches. With, no, wow. that was no. They, it was a good thing. They let it drop, and he finished the at bat. Oh, and I'm got sorry. The strikeout. I listened to you. Yeah. Man. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. They and they, cheap. yeah. <laughs> the, no. Then the manager left him in for like 125 pitches. They let him get the 200 strikeout. Got him like 200 grand or something like that. Great. And I think the Royals actually are a team. That's a good question, Robbie, because they do kind of fit this same bill as the the A's and the Reds as a team who might be willing to compete, who definitely could use someone to play either third base or corner outfield, depending on again, what Merrifield, again, he's a consummate pro, plays everywhere. And they also have a lot of young pitchers who I'm sure they want to get a look at. Like behind Mike Miner in that rotation is Brad Keller, who innings either, he's not spectacular, but he does the job. But then they have Brady Singer, Carlos Hernandez, Chris Bubich, Daniel Lynch, and Jackson Kowar, all of which are less than two years in the league, all of which, besides for Hernandez, were high draft picks, and all of which have at least a modicum of potential. So I think that he actually could make sense as someone who could be on the move. But the fact that he wasn't made even kind of available at the trade deadline last year makes me think that he's probably someone who wouldn't be moved now because the Royals were very blatantly out of it last year after a very hot April, had some people believing. So it would have made sense for them to trade a guy like Miner, even though he was having a bad year, but he still is a guy who strikes a lot of people out. So I think he could be useful. I do think that I would I would call them on Mike Miner. I like Mike Miner a lot. I think Miner might be a situation where the Mets kind of show more interest in, if at all, maybe by the trade deadline, depending on, of course, what their rotation status is and where the Royals are, too. I think something that's important to look at with what the talk is right now with the Mets this offseason is I think there is also a solid chance that the Mets are not going to be able to get everything done, of course, this offseason to what they like to do directly in part with the lockout. And that's where the trade deadline just becomes that more pivotal because they're going to put out a roster that's going to be productive, that hopefully helps lead this team to a division win. But come the trade deadline they're going to be able to evaluate everything now they're in a spot where they're going to potentially have assets that they would be willing to part with knowing that they're not focused nearly as much as maybe what they were last year or what they were quoted as saying that they didn't want to hurt the locker room chemistry which in hindsight you know i think that's almost the farthest thing from the truth yeah definitely and i think that the mess kind of got in trouble with that where and this kind of maybe i don't want to compare these two players because it might make some people upset but Look at a guy like Dom Smith, who's probably never going to have the trade value ever again that he had one year ago. And the fact that there were rumors, while unsubstantiated, we don't know if they were true or not, that he could have been a central piece in a possible acquisition of Jose Barrios, which makes me sick to my stomach every single day thinking about. So if you can use a guy like Jeff McNeil, again, who we don't know what his value looks like a year from now, whether you think it's going to go up or down, I think that sometimes you do just have to get what you need when you need it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that one for sure. But another comment here from Henry. Thank you so much for the $5 donation. Appreciate that. It says, can the Mets maximize McNeil, the White Sox? To I think you meant to say A's here, so I might just assume you meant to say A's. I, I think he means like kind of do a flip, like trade McNeil for prospects and then trade those prospects and like add prospects to your pools. You were more willing to trade prospects. Oh, okay. I got like, you. Okay. Yeah, maximize the trade value. But I mean, I think that's possible. I think the, the McNeil has been linked to the White Sox a lot because – they need they a left-handed bat, yeah, and they don't really have a very obvious fix right now at second base. But, I mean, I don't know. The, the White Sox also run kind of an old-school organization over there, so they might be a team who is more um, – they would value Jeff McNeil a little bit more highly. And they also – I mean, they got – right now, Fangrass has Adam Engel as getting their most at-bats in, in the corner outfield. But get, I think they got they have to find a place for Andrew Vaughn because he's, one, in my opinion, one of the most exciting young players in all of baseball. I picked but, him as winning rookie of the year heading into the season. So. I bet him I bet him to win rookie of the year last season, but <laughs> I, I, I think he's great. And I, I just it does make sense, but I also don't really know what type of prospects the um the White Sox even have to trade right now. Like I don't know how robust that system is, given a lot yeah. of the moves they made recently. You know, they traded Nick Madrigal for Craig Kimberly, and so I don't know what exactly they're looking at in their system down there. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I, I think with White Sox too, I just don't see it as much of a likely fit because I don't feel that Mc, the Mets would trade McNeil in this scenario, uh, really unless that they're going for at least some type of bona fide starter with that club. Like I don't see them doing really anything outside that. So the White Sox, you know, the only talk I've really seen with them is, you know, I know that Kimbrel's available. I want nothing to do with him, if I'm being honest with you. I, I know that there's appeal. I know that might be a little bit of a hot take, but I'm someone that unless you give up little to nothing to acquire him, I'm I'm just I don't see I don't see the White Sox being a great fit 
for what the Mets are trying to do right now. I, I would love many players from them. White Sox are my favorite team in the AL, have been since they landed Giolito. I'm like, okay, I'm on that <laughs> wave. But uh, what's what's your take on that? Yeah, I just, I, I don't, I, the White Sox would make more sense from a maximization standpoint if they did have the prospects to trade. But just scrolling their top prospects on Fangrass very quickly right now, they don't currently have one guy in this organization who's currently at a 50 future value. And for people who don't, know what that means prospects are graded on a 20 to 80 scale 50 being the number where a player is considered to be have good enough potential to be a consistent starter in the major leagues they don't have one guy in their whole farm system right now who's considered that they have guys with 40 plus who are 40s who could rise to be 50s but that'd be a little bit more of a um of a, a riskier route for the Mets to go I just don't know if that's where they're thinking right now for Jeff McNeil no, I tend to agree with you on that one, too. I think the Mets are probably going to look for something as certain as possible if they're going to be in a scenario where they trade Jeff, right? Outside of that, I just don't see it as much of a likelihood. And not to saying a three-team trade isn't impossible. It's happened before Major League Mets Baseball. It la- Mets yeah, Mets did last, last year. Uh, uh, last loss offseason, my goodness. Khalil Lee, Andrew Benintendi. So it's possible that the White Sox could be part of a way to facilitate a three-team trade, sending some prospects elsewhere. They get Jeff McNeil and the Mets get – Luis Castillo or something. I don't know. But <laughs> I, I think that they could be used in a trade, but I, I don't they, I don't see them having the pieces again for the Mets to maximize McNeil's value just because their farm system right now is kind of depleted because they've been they're they're all in. Yeah. No, absolutely. So got two comments and then we're gonna and then we're gonna wrap things up for the stream, folks. So again, thank you guys for being here. Matthew, great support on the channel. Thank you so much for the five dollar donation. He says, I wonder what the Mets do for a lefty bat without McNeil. You would think that they would want a lefty bat, Schwarber as a DH or something else. I mean, I I would love nothing more than Schwarber as DH. I don't see the Mets going out of their way to make that happen on a multi-year deal for a DH. Mm-hmm. I think if the Mets are going to go externally for a DH and free agency, I think Nelson Cruz is their guy on a one-year deal, personally. I think that would make a lot of sense. I know that he can't play anything. <laughs> I'm aware. I know that that's the biggest hiccup with him, along with his age, but... I think if the Mets are going to do anything for agency wise, DH, I think it's Nelson Cruz or Bust. Personally, what's your I think I think that this Mets roster has too many guys who can't play defense to facilitate Nelson Cruz. Like, and that and that's a fair argument. Yeah, it's hard to roster JD Davis and Nelson Cruz because then you need. Well, I don't think have, I don't think JD is here. I, you know, I, there's a chance, but I just don't know who's getting him in the trade. But Matthew, the left-handed bat who's taking the place of Jeff McNeil, I'll give you a hint. His name rhymes with Bobinson Bono. <laughs> it's a guy who's going to get probably more at bats than any of us think as of right now. And the Mets, I think, are still probably going to go into next season with Dominic Smith on this roster. And like that is another left handed bat. I also, I believe Khalil Lee's a lefty, if I'm not mistaken. He's yeah, left handed he bat, right? Yeah. I think you're going to see Khalil Lee with this club next year for sure as well. That's the way, just based on the way he hit last year in AAA, I think there's it'd be it'd be almost foolish to send him back down there. He was 60% better than league average in AAA. So I think there's reason to believe that he can be at least an above average bench bat and defensive replacement with this club next year. So the Mets do have a couple lefties scattered around this roster. They're not really the names that you want to hear, I'm sure, but there's people that they're going to give some shots to, I think. Yeah, I think Lee is 100% gaining a solid shot at the bench next year, you know, especially after what he did. I, I know he didn't have a good stint with the Mets last year, but he was rushed. I put zero stock yeah, yeah. into that. What he did, you know, he was one of the best outfielders in all of uh, minor league baseball last 100%. season shouldn't be underestimated at all. He had an amazing plate approach. So yeah, I agree with you on that one. I think Lee could be one of those biggest X factors for sure. But Josh with a five dollar donation. Thank you so much for that, Josh. McNeil plus prospects for Chapman and Bass. It seems to make the most sense. I think that that is a pretty likely scenario if you ask me. Um, and I definitely will be talking about it again soon. But yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense with the A's, especially in landing Chapman along with one of their pitchers. Mm-hmm. And uh, last but not least, Gotti with a $5 donation. Thank Gotti. you so much for that. Um, how how about Rendon? Okay. Use our trade chips for Bassett Chapman. Happy New Year, my friend. Keep all the great work. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Rendon. No. Uh, we're I don't gonna, think going to happen. No, I, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> now, let me put it this way. Billy Epler wasn't in favor of Rendon to begin with, if I'm being honest. Artie Mourinho literally pushed him aside after he lost out on Colin Wheeler and said, I'm going to do it myself. Just threw the bag at Rendon. So I don't think that in itself is going to be a rekindled relationship, nor do I think that the Mets want anything to do with that contract, especially given the third base prospects they currently have in Brett Beatty and Mark Vianto. So again, obvious reasons why I don't see it happening, but Bassett or Chapman, I think that that can make sense. And Jose, $5 donation. Thank you for that. Nelson Cruz was set up, uh, set us up at DH. Lovely. I agree. Let me put it this way. I think that it just makes a lot of sense. 
assuming that one Robinson Cano is either off this roster, you know, that his contract is buried or something Two, that one of JD Davis or Dom Smith is trade and three bucks. Show Walter heavily advocates for him, which I do think is a strong possibility. So all those factors go into why I think Delson Cruz makes sense, especially on the short term. I mean, I I'd be a fool to say I wouldn't be in favor of booms to coming the Mets, but again, that's probably oh. me being a little biased here. Yeah, he's still one of the best hitters in baseball. I love him on the Mets. I just did. You're right that they will need to massage this roster a little more to be able to fit him. No, absolutely right. And we'll see what comes of that last one. My goodness. And Sandy, thank you for the donation. Cancel black bias and uh, get it for a, uh, for Christmas, keeping it okay. I know that, yeah, I'm pretty sure that he ordered the uh, Black Bias jersey before we found out the news. And I was saying, I wouldn't do that, you know, like I, I felt like he was a lock, I was proven wrong with a lot of things, but no less. Appreciate the donation, Sandy. Hope you had a happy holiday. But with that being said, folks, that's going to wrap up the stream. Hope you guys enjoyed whether you watch live or on replay. Make sure to let me know your thoughts in the comments after the fact, as always. Again, huge shout out to our good friend James Shiano, who does a great job with Draft Neck Mark for his Mets Up podcast. They'll be back on the channel plenty in the offseason and throughout the season. So make sure to check them out. Links in the description. As always, folks, make sure to check out the YouTube channel too. I think a lot of you guys don't know about the YouTube channel yet. So please make sure to check it out if you haven't. They're doing great things over there. And yeah, James, um, any final words before we wrap things up? No, just everyone follow me on Twitter. G there had no range. I have a random baseball players thread going right now. It's currently up to 815 replies. So we're trying to get oh, that. I have to check to- it out trying to get that to 1000 by the end of the night. So everyone hop in there and give me the most random baseball player you could think of and follow me, please up to 3,100 followers. So let me know guys. Glad to be here. Worthy. Thank you. No, thank you. Really appreciate it. Again, appreciate all you guys watching hit that like and subscribe as always. And guys, we'll be back on the channel again tomorrow and probably Thursday as well with another video. So stay tuned. Appreciate you guys. And of course, let's go Mets, baby. Talk to you guys soon. Let's go Mets.